Complex, the friendly finds of the Durham College Athletic Complex, home of the Lords. And we've got women's and men's basketball doubleheader action today. The first game up will feature the George Brown College Huskies from Toronto and our Durham Lady Lords. Stay tuned for our second half doubleheader action, which will see the Lords take to the court against the Huskies. Game two of today's doubleheader. My name is Ken Babcock. I'll be bringing you today's play-by-play. -play. Joined, as always, by Mr. Matt Ackler from the OCAA Central Office and also from the Toronto Raptors Central Office just recently. We've got a dandy basketball lineup today. Matt, give us an idea what we can expect in today's games. Well, the, the opening game, of course, very, very critical for the Durham Lady Lords. They're 4-8, trying to get into the final playoff spot. And as you mentioned to me earlier, Ken, at the mass win situation, absolutely. They have to win every game against George Brown. George Brown at 6-7 and seven is one of the teams ahead of them, but one of those teams they can't beat. It's going to be a great matchup, I think, and we have a lot of things to look forward to in today's opening game. Well, certainly the George Brown Huskies, led by Sandris James, their all-star set center will no doubt be a big part of the George Brown Husky squad and Durham led by a leading scorer the number one scorer in the OCAA Julie Goodhouse at 20.9 points per game a familiar spot for her Matt that's right she leads all scorers in the OCAA an all-star also will be counting on Colleen Trawati an all-star as well who both participated at the OCAA all-star games this past January 21st Durham College coming in at four and eight as we mentioned Matt George Brown six and seven this is a must-win situation for the Durham Lady Lords if they have any type of hope of making the Division I playoffs. Currently, they sit now in seventh place. They need to finish in the top six to make the OCAA playoffs. Durham College with two ever so important factors. They play George Brown twice. They must win at least both of those games. But in fact, the games against George Brown count the most because George Brown is the team they're chasing in the playoff hunt right now. The second half game, Lords Huskies to come later. But first of all, we're moments away from tip-off of this regular season matchup, do or die situation matchup for the Durham Lady Lords as they'll face the George Brown Huskies. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers response line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. We're back here, moments away from tip-off. It's George Brown College, Durham, Lady Lords on tap here. Must-win situation, Matt, as we mentioned in the opening. We talk about a must-win situation. Coach Ernie Rainbow, assistant coach Mike Duggan have to come up with a win with their Lady Lords troops tonight. They've primed their girls all week at practice. I got to speak with both coaches all week talking about what this game meant. They know what it means. They must win this game to make the playoffs, or not to make the playoffs, rather, but they must win this game to entertain any hopes of making the playoffs. So this one, along with a number of games to come, let's take a look at the Division I standings right now as we're waiting for the tip-off. And uh, we talk about George Brown, a tough team. Two matchups to come. Durham plays today, and they also play two weeks from now at George Brown. They must win both of those games to entertain a hope of making the playoffs. We'll have the, uh, we'll have the Western correction, the Division I women's standings a little bit later. We're set to tip off here. It's Julie Goodhouse, her familiar number 44, Heidi Wayne, Heidi Brown, Cindy, rather uh, Sharon, Sharon Cook. Cook's out there. Colleen Sherwati to start for the Lady Lords. We'll tip it off right now. And George Brown wins the tip. And right from the opening tip, Warwick misses for George Brown. But Sandris James, her familiar number 24, lays it in. And starting for George Brown is Ida Gabrielle, Sandris James, Maureen Rooney, Suzette Simpson, and of course number 10, Charmaine Warwick. Again, we saw Sandris James get offensive rebounds also at the All-Star game, and we saw her do the same thing here today to start the game. Now, Durham's first possession does not go well. However, it goes back to George Brown. And work it inside. It'll go over to Durham here. Durham coming off a big game on the weekend against Mohawk. They came out on the short end of a decision, 65-44 at the hands of the Mountaineers on the road in Hamilton. But definitely must win game tonight at Fort Durham. Well, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Mohawk definitely one of the top teams in the league with a 9-3 record. Durham at this point, as mentioned, Ken has to win them all down the stretch. This is where it starts. This is essentially a playoff game for Durham. See the early going, something Durham has to do. Coach Rainbow stressing all season long. They have to move the ball. They do there. Nice pass there from Trawati into Goodhouse. And Goodhouse draws the foul. 
That's what Durham has to do today to be successful. Move the ball around the perimeter and look to move the ball inside whenever they get it and pop it out if it's double team and triple team. We certainly know Julie gets a lot of that. We saw double, double teaming is often the case against Goodhouse. Super movement of the ball. The other thing Durham's going to have to do in this game is avoid turnovers. That's plagued them in other games in the past. Let's see how that goes. That's Sharon Cook. Opens up the scoring for Durham. And we're tied at two here in the early going of this OCAA regular season match. And we got a referee's timeout here. We got a timeout here. Referee Dino Zano here is taking time out to the coaches and the minor officials at the bench. There's something wrong here. I can't get to watch this. Team fouls, guest one. Look at where it's Well, we have this break on right now. Short break. Uh, we can go to the commercials here. We just started play just under two minutes into the game. Correction, one minute into the game. We'll take a break here. You're watching OCAA Women's Basketball Action on Rogers Community 10. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. Hey, we take a time out right now. We're back to action here. Just a slight moment here. They're changing the main game score clock. A technical problem with the scoring apparatus as they attempt to uh, fix that and get the score put back up on the board. We're going to take a look at the women's Division One standings right now and also the scores from around the OCAA and recent play on the women's circuit. As we see there, Ken Hummer still undefeated, going for an undefeated season as they did a couple of years ago. 13-0 in first place, a strong year all the way throughout. Fanshaw is the defending gold medal champs in OCAA women's play at 10-1. Mohawk, we talked about what a good team they are, 9-3. And, and we see it's a number of teams there cluster. Niagara, George Brown, Seneca, 7-6, seven 6-7. And, six, six and, and Durham there at 4-8, they're trying to catch up to those teams. They want to get into the playoffs. That was the goal of Coach Ernie Rainbow and the squad at the beginning of the year, and they have to win these games. We'll take a look around the OCAA. George Brown coming off a huge loss against Humber, of course. Humber, the class of the league and undefeated right now. And we see Durham's record as well, Mohawk 65. Durham 44. The Lady Lords have four games remaining, and this is a big one. We're back to action now. Into James Chawadi tries to tie it up and does. And it's a jump ball possession. In this case, goes to Durham. Heidi Wayne to inbounds. We're tied at two. 18-46 remaining in the first half. Good defensive play by Chawadi that had tied the ball and caused a turnover. Where we got a piece of that one. Shawati quickly grabs it back. Sees Wayne baseline, nice dish inside. Turn around to Goodhouse. Now that bucket goes, and that's what Durham has to consistently do. And they take the early lead here. Durham's first lead of the game. Again, we see the good passing on the part of the Lady Lords. James Tufty there. Shawati with it now. And away come the Lady Lords again. Tough D so far we see in the early going. And also Chihuahua had a fast break opportunity there to Cook, but smartly decided to hold off because it wasn't a clear-cut fast break. And now they set up in a half-court O. Here's Brown. Passes it away right into the hands of a Husky defender. Suzanne Simpson, however, she runs out of room on the end. It'll be Durham Ball with a fresh 30. Heidi Brown's got to be a little more careful with the ball. She had the ball up, and even though Simpson's a smaller player, she jumped and and stole the ball, knocked it away. There's Jawadi now at the top. She'll quarterback the offense. Warwick gets a piece of that again, ever so quick on defense. Inside Brown, had a chance to shoot to Lex to soft back outside. She had the shot back outside. Wayne this time rebounded. Heidi Wayne, some player that Coach Rebo would like nothing more to see her get more involved in the offense, and that's Heidi Wayne. And she hits for that bucket, and Durham leads 6-2 here in the early going. Three different players have scored. That's a good sign for Durham. The team usually relies very much on Goodhouse to be leading score in the OCAA, but this time what they need usually on the, game, the games that have been successful is games where other players have scored, got up to that double-digit scoring column. Well, that foul, that play there goes against number 14, Ida Gabriel. Her first personal foul, timeout, George Brown on the court here. 17-27 remaining. It's a four-point Durham lead in this must-win situation. You're watching OCAA college basketball action, basketball action on Rogers 
Tim Rogers, Community 10. And we'll take time out right now. We'll be back with more action in a moment. Coach Duggan here, Coach Rainbow. A last minute words to their troops there, taking advantage of the George Brown timeout. They're back in action here. It'll be Durham Ball. They lead 6 2 here in the early going, and Matt definitely what Coach Rainbow wanted to see. They haven't got off to the best of starts. They got off to a terrible start in Hamilton on the weekend, trailing by 16 at the 10 minute mark. And it looks like they're trying to make amends of that and get the quick start. Certainly, the team has had strong second halves the last three games. Let's see what they can do now with this quick start. Perhaps it's the realization of the importance of this game. They don't want to get behind and find themselves playing catch-up the rest of the way. Well, that's a big foul there. We see called underneath the basket, number 14. If it we're correct here with our score, that's Gabrielle's third personal foul. Team's third. She's at all three. And uh, big foul trouble for uh, Gabrielle here in the early going with her third foul already. Well, when you guard Julie Goodhouse, it's not uncommon occurrence to pick up a lot of fouls, leading scoring the league, as we mentioned several times already. Great interior pass off the inbounds. Nice pass there. Chawadi regains it, takes it right to the hole, goes around. James can't get it to go, unfortunately. And back come the Huskies. But nice offensive moves nonetheless by the Lady Lords. And George Brown sets up their half court. Warwick inside. Gabriel this time, and it's a foul the opposite way. It's going to go against Heidi Wayne. And that'll be Heidi's first foul. And also the team's first, Matt.
decided to move her, move her body, turn her shoulder to the defender, and you'll get called every time just about on that. Jasbeck called for the foul. Warwick makes one of two. There's Miller, partial three on one now. Dishes off Cook, jump shot, a piece of the ball there by Maureen Rooney. However, she got it with the body as well. Cook's going to go to the line here to shoot two. I think we heard a foul from all the way over here, Kenneth. It was a no, long, no doubt about long that. way away. You can hear it bellowing off the back of the gym wall. Cook with four points in the game. She'll go to the line here to try to increase Durham's 12-point lead. I've been impressed with Sharon Cook's performance so far today. Good defense. They had a steal and a couple of layups. She's got four points, averaging less than three. She makes her first free throw. She's now got five for the game. Two to eight, Durham with a big lead. They have the press, they show it, and they decide to pull back here with big lead and 7.30 to go. <laughs> Calling kickball on that defensive play. George Brown will maintain possession and they'll reset the shot clock at the usual 30 seconds. George Brown has the ball on the far side. <laughs> Off the mark there, Cook, right into the hands of Sharon Cook. And she'll bring the ball up here. Durham looking to increase her 14-point lead. 7.20 remaining first half. Jackie Green didn't go. James outlets there. And Rooney passes it back to Simpson. And away come the Huskies. And we got to see them really get going here if they want to get back into this game. Durham playing an outstanding first half. We all know they have had strong second halves. James with a power move there, showing her all-star caliber talent. She now has six points in the game, and it's a 12-point Durham lead. I'm not sure if the way uh, George Brown started this game, perhaps they took Durham a bit lightly. They look at them maybe a 4-8 team. Of course, they haven't seen them play, and we know that Durham is better than 4-8. Stasiak chases it down. Miller is swing it again. Cook this time, 12 in the shot clock. <laughs> turnovers, we haven't had a lot of them yet. Durham made now three turnovers the last three trips down. Not a trend the coaches want to see happen here. They've been very solid with the turnover department so far. The last couple of minutes, Durham's been playing without both All-Stars, Julie Goodhouse and Colleen Cherwadi, and they still played well. They played even in that last couple of minutes. Substitution coming in, as I just mentioned, both those players coming in, along as well, number five, Heidi Brown, one of the more experienced players on the team, one of the few returners from last year's playoff squad. Stasiak sits down, as we mentioned in the game now, Chawadi, Brown, and Goodhouse. They join Cook and Miller to put a good squad out there. Still have the size advantage. Warwick so quick there, got a piece of it. Chawadi had to pick up her dribble. Brown, Miller double teamed there, no one on her. You see what to know what to do with it there. Instead of turning around, maybe taking a shot at shooting the ball. She's laughing about it now. She knows she should have. Got six. six seconds on the shot clock here. Cook to inbounds. Durham has to get a shot away quickly if they want to get a, an effective shot. Here's Trawati. Four on the shot clock. Sees Cook. Nice pass inside. And I can't get it to go. Good. Cook was certainly aware of the shot clock. I don't sure Tra Trawati was. I, I think she was. Cook certainly knew about it. Got the shot away quickly. Here's Simpson now. 547 remaining first half. Lady Lords by 12. James trying to save it and can't. Durham ball here. Remind you today as well, the second half of our doubleheader OCAA basketball action today. We'll see the George Brown men's squad taking on the number eight ranked team in the country, the Durham Lords. We'll take a look right now at the women's scoring leaders and Julie Goodhouse on top, 20.9 points per game. And leading the way again, but followed closely behind a couple of fan shot stars that we've both seen, Matt. We've seen them play over the last couple of years and also we've seen them play in the All-Star game played for the last two years there at Durham. And we see at the bottom there, Sandris James from George Brown, leading scorer for the Huskies at 13.4 points a game. And she pointed out also Cindy Tindall from St. Lawrence College, MVP of the All-Star game, played just a couple weeks ago. So outstanding players are back to live action here. Here's Cook right side now. Brown sees good as wide open for 15. Can't get it to go there. Nice pass by Brown, however, but nothing to show for. Him. 
Thurman had an opportunity to push the ball there. Could have had perhaps a three on two break, but again, Chirwadi decided, let's play it safe. We've got the big lead here, 22 10. We're playing smart. Let's keep it that way. Good house turnaround jumper. Can't get it to go. Cook in great position underneath. She's going to draw the foul. And Sharon Cook is going to go to the line here. And we're in a bonus situation. Cook will go to the line here, shooting one and one. Natalie Simpson called for a foul. First personal foul. Sharon Cook, a native of Ajax, Ontario, Ajax High School. She made her high school playing days and also enrolled in law and security administration. A welcome addition to Coach Rainbow Squad. And Cook looking to add to Durham's 12 point lead. She's been a few minutes ago, we saw at the line. Nice form, two clean and swish free throws. Let's see if she can do it again. Off the mark there, right back in her hands, dishes off. Brown had an opportunity to shoot the ball. Three seconds, and she's got to shoot that ball from eight feet. Brown not known for scoring, however, does have does have a great shooting touch, but doesn't shoot a lot. She's a, she's a great defensive player, obviously known for outstanding defense and her passing ability. Needs to shoot a little more and create a little more offensive ability. But uh, I think Coach Rainbow will excuse that. That bucket goes there. Maureen Rooney hits it. Ten point lead now. We're approaching four minutes remaining in the first half. Linda Thompson, number 22, now into the game for Durham. She'll swing it wide. And there's Shawadi again with 15 at the shot clock. Got the dribble through two there. Good. There's Simpson. She's going to pick up the ball. Double dribble there. She's got a little excited when she saw two open teammates rushing down the sideline. Simpson usually quite good handling the ball. We've seen her quickness and her penetration ability, but that this time, just a little too quick for herself. Here's Miller, fresh 30, 352 remaining first half. Just inside three-point range, Thompson off the mark, and back comes Rooney, number 23. Simpson, closely guarded by Chirwadi. Warwick from outside, haven't seen that yet, off the mark, rebound. Rooney can't get it to go. They battle for it again. That'll be gold ball there. Last touched by Maureen Rooney. 22-12, 10 point. Lady Lords lead here. Looking to add to it. Durham a bit of a stall right now as far as their offensive output. They haven't moved the board on the left side now for over three minutes. One point to get, <coughs> excuse me, the score is about 18-5. But since then, George Brown has scored the Lords, Lady Lords by 7-4. Durham is not in position really to be coasting at any point. They need they need to go all out for the whole 40 minutes. Thompson there committing two errors in that particular play. We look to take a look at Clinton. Clinton is shooting the ball. Good shot. Good range. Ball came right back to her. Didn't follow her shot. Then on the ensuing play on the rebound, she commits a foul. So it's going to mean a, an opportunity at the bonus line here for George Brown. Well, I don't think coaches really complain when you have a, a wide open shot from 10 or 15 feet. There's there's no uh, concern about that. Follow your shot. Here's Simpson at the line, shooting one and one. Her first trip to the line. And can't get the friendly roll there. Goodhouse clears out with the boards. Everyone is in rebounding position for a while. That ball bounced about three or four times off the ring. Thompson right to Warwick here. Warwick has a break all alone. She'll lay it up. Can't get it to go. And that ball's going to go back to Durham. George Brown can't finish off. Well, Thompson made a bad pass there. She telegraphed that all the way, and of course, a steal by Warwick. That's happened a couple times now for the Durham Lee Lords. They've got to fake high and go low, fake low and go high, do something to make sure that they don't turn over the ball. That was <clears throat> killed them in a couple games, and they didn't do, weren't doing it for the first 10 or 15 minutes. Chawadi, nice pass inside. Brown, as you mentioned, partial block. Goodhouse is a big rebound. She'll take it up strong. Goodhouse for two. She now has 12 points, and so she's going to go to the line here to add a bonus shot as she draws a foul. The basket counts. Goodhouse with a first chance for a three-point play today, but you see what a scores mentality she has, Ken. She knew that uh, Wayne, on uh, excuse me, Heidi Brown shot the ball was tipped. She went right into the basket, got the rebound, and went straight up and went up, went up strong to get the bucket. And Goodhouse hits there, averaging 66% from the foul line on the season. She's gone to the line. We count that time 97 times this season. Outstanding player. Has seen a lot of trip at the charity strike this, this season. And she now has 
what we call a big game in the first half. 13 points in the first half for Goodhouse. You talk about going the line, as you mentioned, Goodhouse beat the learn, excuse me, beat the line 97 times, far and away the most in the OCAA this year. San Andreas just off the mark. First one left it a little short. James leads the Brown squad here, 13.4 points per game on the season. She's got six so far in the first half. Off yeah. the mark again, misses both. Right in the hands of Heidi Brown. Quick hit left to Chawadi, and Durham with possession again. 2-11 now remaining first half. The Lady Lords look to increase their 13-point lead. Stolen away again, Miller, the victim of a bad pass there. Warwick, no doubt about that one. Shulay in the veteran guard, hits her first bucket of the game. That's number 10, Charmaine Warwick. I, I thought we mentioned Ken about telegraphing passes, and it happened one more time. I'm sure that's something that'll be discussed at halftime in the Durham locker room. Nice try there. Brown keeps it alive, though. Goodhouse takes it. That bucket's going to go. Goodhouse with a lucky roll again. She's got the magic touch going tonight. Friend the roll on that home court rim. to add to her total right now. She has 15 on the game. Julie Goodhouse, we might mention here, also a holder of the Durham College Ladies single game record of points scored in the game. 34 set one year ago. And ironically, it was set against the same George Brown team last January. And she's on a pace to meet the ladder perhaps better. She's got 16 thus far in the first half. Still a minute and a half to go. Still a minute and a half to go. Sanders James is called with the offensive foul, pushing off with the elbow. Pushing off against Goodhouse. Good job of defense by Julie Goodhouse. She can play offense, we know that. But right there, she also plays some tough. She also plays some tough D. Good idea by Chawani, but the ball just went just a little high into the wide open. Heidi Brown. Turnover. 28-14, 14 point lead for the Durham Lake Lords and 122 to go. I'm sure coaches Duggan and Rainbow are encouraging their squad to keep up the tough defense and, their, and the ball control for the rest of the half and to maintain this 14 point lead. Hey, Miller, nice defensive play there to shut off her man. Back come the Lady Lords. Outstanding first half of the Lady Lords here. We coach the one minute mark. Thompson just off the market shot. James going for traveling there to be Durham ball on the end line. 14 point Lady Lords lead. There's Goodhouse. Right in the hands of Warwick. She's become a specialist in picking up bad Lady Lords passes. Warwick all the way down. You can count that one in the bag for two. 28 16. But Goodhouse did there. She went there. She jumped up in the air, not knowing what she was going to do with it. One of the big mistakes that a basketball player could make. Turn the ball over quickly there. 45.9 seconds remaining in the first half. Mike Dye encouraging his squad to play defense in the last 44 seconds or so. Keep those hands up, keep the feet moving. That's more important. There's Warwick, 20 in the shot clock. Off the mark there. James rips it away from Brown there. James is 30 now. Strength. Shot clock doesn't matter now. 25 seconds remaining. 20 in the shot clock, George Brown pulling it out. Looks to move the ball in at about 12 seconds. 12 seconds now, shot attempt there, jump ball with 11.2 seconds to go. A jump ball for Sarah Laurie Peterson having the ball blocked. Arrow favors Durham, 11.2 seconds. Here's Miller. Five seconds. She's got to hurry up a bit, I think. Two seconds, Thompson wide open off the glass. Can't get it to go, but a good shot attempt nonetheless. Thompson just off the mark. Great shot opportunity. The Durham Lady Lords at half lead the George Brown Huskies. The score, Durham 28. The George Brown Huskies 16. 12 point lead for the Lawrence Matt. Certainly what Coach Rainbow wanted his team to come out fired up, and they certainly have. It was a, it was a great first half for the Durham Lady Lords. They really needed that. As you mentioned, a few couple slow starts, but tough defense and a good solid offense gives them a 12 point lead. Great team effort so far from the Lady Lords. We'll be back with exciting second half action. The Durham Lady Lords lead by 12. We'll be back with second half action in a moment on Rogers Community 10.
you have an upcoming sporting event that you'd like advertised free of charge? Well, you can get your message into almost 74,000 homes across Europe on the Goal Line Upcoming Events Billboard. Just call Tom at 436-4141 or leave your name and phone number on the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500 and we'll get back to you. It's as easy as a phone call and there's no charge. The Goal Line Upcoming Events Billboard, only on Durham Region's Spirit of Sport. Goal Line, get with the program. Off at the second half of this OCAA contest, and Matt Durham College playing a solid first half, one of the best halves of basketball I've seen them play this season. It was indeed a super first half of basketball. But what we have to do, if we want to see if this Durham team is for real, are they going to uh, copy that to the second half? Are they going to have a strong second half as well? One point they were leading this game 20 to 5, and now it's 28 16. So since that point, about halfway through the game, uh, halfway through the first half. It was pretty even, in fact, a little bit in George Bound's favor. Let's have to see what Durham comes out in the second half. We know that this is a, essentially a playoff game. For the Atlantic Boards, and guys, you mentioned, got to win all their games the rest of the way, the remaining four games to get into the playoffs. This is where it starts. This is a playoff-type game for them. Well, as they get ready to go here, second half action. We all know Durham has had a great second half. They had an outstanding second half on Saturday, although it was too much to overcome after their dismal first half. But outscoring Mohawk on Saturday was a great power. So this looks like they've taken that second half and really transpired into a positive start today in this must-win situation. Durham must win both meetings. This is the first of two against George Brown. If they entertain any hopes of making the playoffs and then ultimately qualifying for a sudden death quarterfinal game and then ultimately nice play boy good house there and ultimately having a chance at making it to the final four can okay, we well, explain the playoffs to begin or was that clear in the first half uh, i don't know if i can get it right i think, oh, I think you did a i think you did a good job first time we saw players again uh, colleen shawati certainly started the I second hope. half strongly with this nice steal and a uh, offensive opportunity there's a test here first bucket the lady lords get the first bucket here that'll really set the tone for the second half Excellent defense there. Julie Goodhouse slamming the door shut on Tremaine. Where are we there? Traveling violation, Durham ball. And as I mentioned, first bucket here would be a real boost to Durham's success in the second half. Excellent help defense just on that last play, as you mentioned, by Goodhouse. Defense has been strong throughout this game. Well, Goodhouse there taking one too many steps. It'll go back to the Huskies. Stay tuned for today's second half of our OCAA doubleheader here on Rogers Community 10. The Durham Lords taking on George Brown following this game in a key East Division matchup. The Durham Lords 6-2 coming off an exciting game. A thrill right down to the dying seconds on Friday night. 79-76 the score is Algonquin 79, Durham 76. Durham's only two losses in their 6-2 conference record happen to come against Algonquin. Durham ranked number eight in the country. George Brown, no easy task as well, sporting Lester Jones, the OCAA's second leading scorer at 27.4 points per game. That's a matchup that's certainly going to be something to look forward to, especially if he goes head to get against the big Cuban, Augusto Duquesne, leading scorer of the OCAA. It's a battle of the top two guys. They're going to put their battle, personal battles on the side. And teams aside, it's going to be interesting matchups to watch it all boil down. Right now, you're watching second half action of the women's game right now, and George Brown looking to get back into this game. The Lady Lords have built up a 12-point first half lead. Let's see what happens. A sloppy first half, uh, sorry, first minute and a half so far in the second half. Number of turnovers on both sides. Nobody scored yet here in the second half. Turner once that again ball goes out of bounds goes there. Down. Gold ball. Goal referring to Durham. We see Charmaine Warwick down here shaking up on the play. I, I suspect she just jammed her finger against the ball. Nothing serious as she gets up. Heidi Wayne and Chirwadi Cook, Brown, and Julie Goodhouse for the Lady Lords. Gabrielle, we see number 14. Ida Gabrielle in the game. She has four fouls. Number 14, watch her. She has had a tough time trying to help out with Julie Goodhouse, and as a result, picked up four quick fouls in the first half. Ten on the shot clock now. Here's Goodhouse. Chawadi now. Winding her way in. Nice pass to Goodhouse. Can't get that to go. They battle for it. Cook with the rebound. 
Yeah, kick ball there. Bit of a five on four opportunity. Simpson went for the steal and she was out of the play. Durham had five on four, but the, maybe a smart play to kick the ball away because you got your defender back. Good house left wide open on that one. You can't do that. She's got 18 on the game to lead all scores. The OCAA's leading scorer, Julie Goodhouse, averaging 20.9 points per game, now has 18. That was the first bucket of the second half, as you mentioned, Ken. Let's see if that carries Durham through for the next little while. That foul is going to go against Heidi Wayne. And that's Heidi's fourth, according to our records. And not what Coach Rainbow and Coach Duggan wanted to see so early in the second half. Wayne slowly creeping in as a freshman. More playing time, contributing more, and really finding out that she can play. It's more of a confidence factor for Heidi Wayne. She has to find that confidence she can play at this level. She's slowly starting to get that, but right now facing four fouls, it's going to take a little bit of her aggressive play out of the, uh, well, out of the game right now for Durham. I think she'll be sitting on the bench to uh, make sure she doesn't pay off that fifth because she's a valuable contributor to this team. 42, Melissa Jazbeck coming in on a strong first half. So Wayne checks out with four. Jazbeck in now. Shot off the line, doesn't go. We got a traveling violation. It'll go over to Durham. Peterson grabbed the rebound there. Good job to do that, but just couldn't keep her feet planted firmly. George Brown falls all the way back into a, let's see if it's a zone, looks like a zone defense here. And uh, Coach McClellan two, here two. for George Brown certainly keying on some of their foul troubles with, with uh, Gabrielle for one. That one doesn't go, Cook just off the mark, Gabrielle at the rebound, certainly seeing a zone would probably help out in their foul situation, have gone to it now in the second half. Warwick, nice save on the sideline, keeps it alive, Simpson. 15 in the shot clock. Here's Warwick baseline. Tried to scoop shot along the baseline. Just couldn't go. James again, the tower of strength. Sandrice James rips it away. She had six in the first half and now has eight on the game. Back to a 12-point lead for Durham. Half of those points to of her total of eight have come off offensive rebounds just like that one was. There's Shawati, nice cross-court pass. Brown saw her wide open, excellent vision by Heidi Brown. Somehow the ball got to Goodhouse. She takes it strong, she draws a foul. I think that ball's a little bit lucky to bounce off a couple hands to get into Goodhouse's possession. Perhaps an ill-advised pass by Shawati, but it worked out best in the end. That foul goes against Charmaine Warwick, her first. Team's first this half, Durham inbounds. 30 second shot clock reset, here's Jazbeck. Nice inbounds. Cook can't get it to go. Good James execution. James and away come the Huskies. Goodhouse runs it down and back come the Lady Lords. Goodhouse wisely setting it up. And Goodhouse like a smart player, as you can see, doesn't doesn't pick up her dribble right away. Maintains all the options. Battle there, Goodhouse against James. Battle of the All Stars. This time, Goodhouse is going to win that battle. Julie Goodhouse had that quick first step, spin move around to the outside and along the baseline for the layup opportunity. Couldn't get it, but she got her own rebound. That's hustle. That's a big foul there. That's the fifth personal foul against number 14, Ida Gabriel. She picked him up early. She's picked him up often with 16 15 remaining in the second half. Gabrielle has found she's fouled out of the game. No points for Gabrielle and a tough loss. One of the starters for George Brown out already. 16-15 remaining in the second half. It's Durham 30. George Brown 18. You're watching the OCAA coverage of women's basketball action from the Durham College Athletic Complex. And we see Coach Rainbow now. I think it's back. Taking advantage of this quick timeout. Because back's probably a little bit better with a 12-4 lead here in the second half. Appears to be okay. Playoff bound. March Madness. I think that has a quick healer as far as backs go. Like, uh, as you mentioned, Kent Gabrielle fouled out with five personal fouls. As we see that the uh, playoff schedule coming up very shortly, OCAA Final Four men's and women's action right here at the Durham College Athletic, Athletic Complex, March 3rd and 4th. It's going to be a huge weekend of college basketball action. The best players in Ontario will be here. Good house at the line now. Smith Falls native. Leading the league in scoring, as we mentioned, we talked about the OCAA Final Four. Anybody got a chance to see the Algonquin game live? It wasn't a TV game live on Friday. Outstanding hoops action every single game, all eight, all four semifinal games, men's and women's, and all four medal games, bronze and gold for men and women, will be exactly like that game, right down to the wire. Last year in Ottawa at the men's championships, every single game was decided with 10 seconds remaining. That was outstanding at basketball last year in Ottawa. And we're going to see more of that this year in Durham College, the host right here in Oshawa. Get your tickets early. Admissions $5.
tickets are sold in session. Session one is a semifinal action on Friday, March 3rd. Session two is the medal round action. Five dollars as well for that. Gives you a pass to session one. And session two, five dollars a piece. Four games for that one ticket admission. An outstanding value. And you're gonna see it right here in your own town. Here's Simpson. Miller, tough D, long time in the key is James. She gets it away, battle underneath. Can't get it to go, and Heidi Brown rips it away, showing tenacity as always on the boards. Rips and it away is the right the Lady phrase Lawrence. indeed. She did, yeah, sorry to interrupt again, but just ripped it away is the right phrase. She did a, that's what you have to do when you're fighting for the for the rebound. And that's what they have to see more of, the Lady Lords have to bear it. Backs against the wall, certainly have risen to the occasion in the first half. Goodhouse. Tough against James. She wins the medal again. Goodhouse now with 20 on the game, just below her season average. She got five here in the second half. In fact, all five Durham Lady Lord points in the second half. Actually, we've added 21 points now. She's just above her season average. She has 21 on the game. 16 in the first half. There's James. Tough D there. Brown battling underneath. Fronts her. That goes wide. Jasbeck tries to save and does to Cook. And with 14-49 remaining, it's a 13-point Durham lead. And this start of the second half is similar to the start of the first half. With five over five minutes played, George Brown's only scored two points thus far in the, in the half. There's Brown had a shot to shoot. Hesitated a moment, let James catch up. Goodhouse follows. And she has seven in the second half, 23 in the game. Goodhouse did a great job there of grabbing the rebound and spinning quickly to the outside away from the defender. And she knew exactly where that ball was going, right up and in. Ah, nice D there, Goodhouse. Playing James well there, intercepts the pass. Sharon Cook now. Jasbeck wide open from 12, off the mark. Brown hustles for it, comes away with it. Miller sets up, however, tipped away. Warwick tries to run it down. And Sharon Cook had to draw a foul. Probably a good foul in essence. It was probably two points for the Huskies. Especially with Charmaine Warwick. We've seen her do that two times already for layups. And she was certainly going all the way for a third right there. As you mentioned, good foul by Cook. Stops the fast break opportunity. That's Sharon's first. Just the team's second this half. And back into the game number 41, we talked about her before, Kathy Stasiuk. And she'll take on the duties of guarding Sandrice James. There's a big, big front line that Durham has him now. Jazbeck about 5'10", Goodhouse 6'1", and Stasak about 6'2". And Stasiak, quick as she's in the game, quick as she grabs a rebound, and back come the Lady Lords here with Sydney Miller. Lady Lords, an outstanding first half, really have come to uh, the forefront offensively. Defense, the name of the game as well, an all-around good half, and Durham looks to be in the same mode second half. I'm sure Coach Rainbow reminded them what this game meant at the half. Goodhouse, nice dish inside. Stasiak right back up, and Stasiak gets for two. Number 41, Kathy Stasiak, an outstanding addition to the Lady Lords, now making her presence felt in the last two games, this one, and also a 13-point effort in Hamilton on the weekend. They talked about the big front line. I think that was a good example right there. Stasiak crashing the boards. No one there to defend her, especially when Goodhouse is in there as well. Stasiak there again, blocks that, rips it down. And right now the Lady Lords are being very stingy. They're not allowing any access to the basket. Work with a quick hands there, quick steal attempt, just a little bit slow, a little bit short. Cook, nice jumper there, back iron doesn't go. Stasiak rebound. However, Stasiak's gonna be called for the foul there. That'll be her first, team's third. Well, nothing wrong with that foul, Ken, nothing at all. It's a good aggressive play going for the rebound if she had, was, at, was able to grab it, which I'm sure would have resulted in at two points for Durham. 19-point lead, 37-18. Certainly the biggest lead of the game so far for Durham. 12-20 to go. Ah, uh, touch foul there. Referee's hammering down on Stasiak. That's her second. Picks it up quickly within a matter of seconds. Team foul number four, and George Brown will hang on to the ball. But nonetheless, the biggest lead of the game, as you mentioned, 19 points. And Jackie Greenell back into the game. Steals the ball away there. And she's got a break, a partial break. Warwick chasing. Takes it to the lane. And she lays it in for two. Jackie Green's on the board. Green of the Sportsman program as well. A direct entry from Mississauga. Went to Streetsville District High School. 
coast to coast for Jackie Green there. First two points of the game. James, Miller. nothing doing there. Miller wraps the rebound, and you notice Stasiak picking up two quick fouls. Went straight up on that one, not allowing the referees to call anything against her. There's Green, quick hands. Dishes off Jazbeck, right back to Green. Nice pass back. Nice give and go, Jackie Green to Jazbeck, back to Green for two. And the Lady Lords have now opened up their biggest lead of the game. 23 points. Ken, what most can we say? One of the most impressive things is aside from obviously from the defense performance, but the balance on offense. Green's getting involved, Jazbeck, Stasak, a whole bunch of players in addition to Goodhouse. That's just what Durham needs. That's what they need all season, and they're certainly getting it today. Maureen Rooney adds her first bucket of the second half. She had three in the first half, now has five. And George Brown now with just four points in the second half. Durham outscoring George Brown 13-4 in the early going here. 11-10 remaining. You want to see a move against Melissa Jasbeck. Indeed, she had set the pick, but she kept moving. You can't do that. Once it's set, you have to keep it there. Jasbeck picks up her third foul. Coach Rainbow, Coach Duggan do not want with the latest rash of fouls. That's their team's fifth this half is to start to get into foul trouble. Here's Simpson. Left wide open, top of the key. Can't get it to go, and who's there? Stasiak to pick the ball up. A little bit too quick out of the gate there, and uh, she's called for traveling. She so did a good job to go after the ball. The most important thing is you have to keep the ball, and she just took an extra step. Jazbeck rips it down. Rips it away from Stasiak. I mean, it's all goal underneath the basket there. As you mentioned, the first half, one and done. And again, the second half, that's the same thing. Same look. story. They look to the middle. Goodhouse seeing it there. Turnaround jumper. Doesn't go Stasiak. Quick to the board. Simpson recovers. Simpson, the and smallest player out there, but grabbed the rebound amongst the trees. Maybe she's the quickest player, allowing her to get it. And a fast break bucket there, an easy bucket there for Maureen Rooney. She now has seven of the game. 19-point lead. We're approaching the halfway mark of this second half. You're watching OCAA women's basketball action on Rogers Community 10. we got a timeout on the floor. Right now, it's Durham 41, and George Brown 22. We'll be back in a moment with more action from the Durham College Athletic Complex on Rogers Community 10. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. Choctaw time here, April McLennan here from George Brown. Stressing the boards now, they have to, they've been beat all night on the boards, they really have. They haven't had a second shot opportunity very often on the boards. Coach McLennan right now trying to get this through to her team before it's too late. 19 points with 10, 20 remaining, not insurmountable, but certainly got to start taking a, a stab at it and starting to chip away. We take a look now at Coach Duggan charting some information here for the Lady Lords. It was in fact uh, the Durham Lady Lords who called that timeout. They were uh, had a bigger lead and just slipped away a couple fast break opportunities for the George Brown Huskies. Cut the lead by a little bit, but I think Durham's got to maintain possession of the ball. Be careful of what they, uh, the Huskies are going to do. They may throw some zones at them. They may throw some presses at them. They may try and do some double teaming and go for some steals to get back in the game that way. No question about it. 41, 22 Durham leads. Durham with the ball in possession as well, calling that timeout. Foul trouble, we talk about foul trouble. Heidi Wayne for Durham with four. So Kathy Stasiak has two. Goodhouse has two. Gabriel already fouled out of the game, a starter for George Brown. And the other person in trouble for George Brown is Suzette Simpson, their point guard, who has three. There's Warwick Green hustles back to slow it down. James forces that one, but luckily gets the ball back. It's a battle under the boards there now. Rooney with a shot, foul there. And we've got another foul. It's going to be two shots for Maureen Rooney. Miller calls with a foul on the arm, on the shot. That'll be two. Cindy Miller picks up her first foul. We talk about the Lady Lords the rest of the way tonight. Speaking of tonight, the Lady Lords after today, three more games left, February 14th versus Seneca, 
That's on the road at Seneca, February 17th. Back here, a 7.30 start on Friday, February 17th against Niagara. And also at George Brown, February 22nd, a key matchup. That's an eight, that's a correction, a 6 o'clock start. Three games to go after today. Durham must win at least three of the four to have a chance of making the playoffs. And the key factor is they have to win today, and they also have to win on February 22nd. Those two key head-to-head -head games. We look at all those games, Niagara, Seneca, George Brown, all teams that are 7-6, six, 6-7. Six These are teams that Durham can beat. It's not like the Humbers of the world who are 13-0 and really tough. We would mention as well, Humber with a little bit of help. They beat Seneca 75-73, and Mohawk as well, beating Seneca 70-64. Seneca now with a 6-7 and seven record as well. But certainly Durham can have the power in their own hands right now. They beat George Brown twice. That puts them in a better situation. That one's tied up. So Jump ball this time. We're looking for the possession arrow. It will be in favor of Durham. 9.38 remaining, second half. Uh, nice pass there from Jackie Green inside to Julie Goodhouse. Goodhouse now with 25 points, nine shy of the single game record, and her season high of 30 set in November. Jackie Green, I, I'd be very impressed with her again, coming off the bench both offensively, defensively, and, and good passing as we saw in that last play. Rooney's had a big second half here. Eight points for 11 for the game, certainly leading scorer for the Huskies today. Yeah, really impressed with uh, Maureen Rooney. Maureen, a solid player. You know, we take a look at her, her scoring percentage as far as that goes. 8.8 .8 points per game, 65% from the line. She has gone to the line 28 times in the season, but certainly uh, showing a season high output here, 11, with her season high being 8.8 .8 points per game. Here's Goodhouse now, 16 in the shot clock. Miller pulls it out. Brown flashes. Here's Green. Running Jay from eight feet on the right side, and Jackie Green hits nothing but net there. She has six points on the game. All of those six points in the second half. She's been a, a spark plug here for them. Nice pass inside. Can't get it to go there. Number 12, Lori Peterson. Tough luck all night for Peterson. Here's Rooney at the hot hand, and the hot hand continues now. Ten points in the second. She has 13 on the game. Number 23, Maureen Rooney. Tipped away again. Miller has not been able to do a very good job getting that pass over to her point guard. And Charmaine Warwick makes her pay for it. Seven on the game for Warwick. That cuts the lead to 15. Ken, is that about four or five times Warwick has done that, stolen the ball? I count five at least, and uh, something Durham has to cut down on because it's an automatic two. And again, they come away with it there. Scramble, however. And it'll be a jump ball this time in the favor of the blue uniformed Huskies. However, they got to cut down on the turnovers. If, uh, if you want, at least with the turnovers, they've got to cut down on the turnovers that are leading to direct fast break buckets. Back of the game for Durham, and Cindy Miller will take a break right now and a breather. And back of the game is number four, Sharon Cook. Cook's done also done a good job throughout the game. She's had a couple of steals herself, just like Warwick has for George Brown. Here's Simpson. That time it was Rudy with the hot hand. That bucket's going to go there. And she knows exactly where she's going to go now. That's Sandrice James for two. She goes right to the foul line. She's going to have an opportunity to add another. This could cut it to 12. I'm sure in the George Brown huddle next time we'll hear that. That was a pass, but that wasn't a, <laughs> that wasn't a pass. Good job by James to crash the offensive board. She's now got 10, chance to make it 11. As you mentioned, cut the lead down even further. James doesn't get it to go. Rooney keeps it alive. Brown chases it down, unaware that it was going to be Durham ball anyway. A good hustle nonetheless, 45-32. Durham leads, 13-point lead, 7-42 remaining in the second half. Certainly we still have a ball game here. Durham perhaps thought they had this one wrapped up, but not the case. Brown, nice pass inside. See Goodhouse there. New 30. Here's Cook over to Green. Shawadi Rooney closely guarding her. Here's Goodhouse. One step around her, finds room. That doesn't go. Cook got a piece of it. Goodhouse keeps it alive. Could have probably been a foul there, but it goes out of bounds. And it's going to be Huskies' ball. Both players hustling for the ball there. Simpson in and Julie Goodhouse. Coach Duggan expressing his sentiments there to the official going by. <laughs> Number one, not to be vocal is Coach Duggan, but certainly had a point there. 
Sips a little bit wide. Warwick chases it down, and she hits for two. Charmaine Warwick now has nine, and that cuts the Durham lead to 11. Cook slows it down here. Durham a little bit excited here. Ball checked there. Here's Green. We had a traveling call. They turned the ball over here. 6.43 remaining second half. And George Brown, if you can feel it building a little bit mad here, I think has a momentum uh, swinging their way right now. Momentum is certainly in the favor of the Huskies. Bucket here can cut it down to single digits. We're having a timeout. I think Durham and realizes the situation. Good timeout call there. Doug calls a timeout there for Durham. 6.43 remaining. As we mentioned just before the timeout, Heidi Wayne subbing back in. She had four fouls, but they certainly need Wayne on the boards. 6.43 remaining. It's Durham of 45. George Brown, 34. Matt, what's Coach Dougie telling them right now? Well, I think he's emphasizing the fact that possession of the ball, don't turn it over. And again, we see Mike Duggan leading the troops as maybe with the uh, deficit uh, cut here, and he right now has a bad back again. He's standing behind, letting Duggan do the talking to the team. Possession of the ball, maintain it. You see him <laughs> some plays there. But also defense, they, when they were playing defense before, they were allowed one shot, they were blocking shots, and that hasn't been the case thus far. We talked about Durham's must-win situation right now. It's an 11-point lead. Certainly seemed uh, a healthy lead at the half of 12. They had it up as high as 21 points at one time. And they've seen that whittle down to 11. George Brown with a bit of momentum building, but the Lady Lords quickly calling timeout to quell any bit of momentum and take a breather here and uh, certainly look at what they're going to do the next uh, six and a half minutes. Good call on the bench. to the end of this game. A good call on the bench for Durham to call the timeout. You see some of the fans there. We had a look at April McClellan there. She was part of the great U of T teams from the 1980s and went all the way to the national championship rounds. Coaching now, as a number of her teammates are, the superstar players now coaching. Julie Take a look at this. Another outstanding game for her. 25 points on the game, but not just to mention that balance scoring. Sharon Cook with six already. Jackie Green has hit the scoreboard for six. Jazz Beck and also Heidi Wayne have contributed. And Heidi Brown doing a great job on the boards along with Stacey Young. I've really, uh, really told the story so far. And the key is turnovers. Not the fact they have, but the fact Durham has not turned the ball over very often. I'll shoot it right there, Warwick. James can't get it to go there. And who's there? Heidi Brown, as we mentioned. Another great job on the boards. And Cook with the ball now. 11-point lead, Durham. Chawadi said a pick there against Warwick, and it's a good thing she didn't get called for moving. She realized that she was possibly going to get called, so she stepped away and let the pick go. There's Cook. Warwick all over here. No foul call there. Here comes Rooney. She's had the hot hand the second half. Checked out of bounds, and Rooney will keep the ball. George Brown underneath the basket. But certainly, uh, if we talk about... Uh, Turnovers Durham now the last couple of possessions have turned the ball over. Part of those turnovers have been a result of the, the more intense George Brown pressure. They're applying that because they realize they're back against the wall here. This is a not a must game win for George Brown, but certainly for an important one. Could clinch a playoff spot for them. There's Peterson. Warwick dishes it off. Try to see James. Doesn't. Out of bounds. Durham ball, 5.56 remaining. Let's see what the Lady Lords can do here. War Warwick's been one of the key spark plugs offensively and defensively. We know she's stolen the ball a number of times for fast break layouts, but she had some good penetration there. And some steals. Durham's got to keep an eye on her. That's what Heidi Wayne has to do. Unlucky there, but that's a shot Heidi Wayne's got to be taking. That's a shot you're going to see a lot of over the next two years as Wayne progresses with her collegiate career. Nice D from Wayne. Taking away Maureen Rooney on the play. Could have been an offensive foul. Wayne and Heidi Brown, they take it right back. Wayne elects to dish off. A little bit too much passing. Two on one, and we got a left. player down at the far end here. It's Maureen Rooney. And it looks like it was a victim of the collision at the other end. Heidi Wayne taking the charge. Rooney looking to dish off. And uh, Rooney down now suffering a knee injury. It might be one of those cases of knee against knee. So. The last place with Heidi Wayne and Heidi Brown coming down. Not your classic two-on-one resulted in a, a, a ball going out of bounds and a turnover. Rooney getting up and walking off the court. Yeah, I think she'll be fine. And, of course, a very valuable player for the George Brown Huskies today. Rooney certainly with a lot in here. Nine points in the second half. 
take her time walking down to the bench area. And uh, Rooney with a big second half. She had 10 points in the second half, 13 of the game. She's going to take a breather. She appears to be okay, a little bit shaken. May just have uh, bruised knee for a Charlie horse. She's going to take her time here. Coming into game to replace her, number 11, Joanne Gomez. Saw a little bit of action in the first half, but not get on the scoring board. There's Warwick. Heidi Wayne guarding her. Simpson 13 in the shot clock. Shot clock down to seven. Simpson this time. Cook at seven seconds in the shot clock. Tough foul for Cook to take. Seven seconds in the shot clock. Ball up at the top, even at the top of the circle. That's Cook's second, but the key thing here, it stops the clock for one thing, and also it's a bonus situation now. George Brown uh, shooting bonus Durham in a situation now. George Brown with only two fouls in the second half. Still five away from the bonus situation. That could be critical down the stretch. One and one opportunity Certainly here. Coach McCullen wanted for George Brown. They get a chance to score points when the clock is stopped. However, George Brown didn't take advantage of that. George Brown, an average shooting team at best, 44% on the season. Durham over 50%. There's Heidi Wayne. They got to reset it. Picked off there. Here's Cook into trouble in the middle. And she's called for traveling. 4.48 to go, and Durham stuck at 45 now. Two minutes they've gone without scoring, and they've really gone away from their movement and ball movement on the offensive zone. When they've been doing that, Ken, as you just pointed out, that's when they've been most effective. They've had a lot of people involved in the sequence of plays. This time, having someone dribble at the top and force a pass, it has not been good result for them. Warwick just off the mark. And back comes Sherwati now. Four and a half minutes remaining. Durham leads by 11. George Brown not been able to hit single digits yet. They had a bit of a run. Durham called timeout wisely. Nice pass from Goodhouse to Brown. Can't get it to go. What a heck of a play there. James just couldn't get it to go. inside, though. She's blocked a couple shots, including one from Goodhouse. Simpson banks one off twice off the backboard and in. Simpson with four in the game. Now it's a nine-point Durham lead. Heidi Way turns the ball over to Simpson. And a timeout on the floor, George Brown. Quickly called by Suzette Simpson. 3.56 remaining. Durham, 45. George Brown now cutting the lead to nine at 36. You're watching OCAA College Basketball Action on Rogers Community 10. George Brown calling a timeout. They have possession of the ball as well. They're going to look here after charting out a play here. They're going to look to cut the lead to seven and uh, hopefully get back into this game right now. George Brown definitely with momentum swing, Matt. Absolutely. The Huskies have momentum in their favor. He's going both ends of the court offensively and defensively. Like Duggan, as you see with Ernie Rainbow standing over his shoulder talking to the troops here. They've got to re-emphasize the importance of this game. This is a must-win situation for the Durham Lady Lords. 3.56 to go. And you see there on the score clock, a uh, bonus situation, in, certainly foul situation, excuse me, certainly in favor of George Brown. Also keep an eye on Maureen Rooney on the bench now. It came out of the game with over four and a half minutes remaining on that collision with Heidi Wayne. Suffered a bruised knee, it looked like, from our angle. And uh, came out, keep an eye on her to hopefully come back into the game. She has been absolutely on fire for George Brown in the second half and leads all George Brown scorers with 13. And we'll see what happens here. George Brown with the ball. 3.56 remaining in the second half. Durman is zoned 2-3 with Goodhouse in the middle. Swing pass Warwick now. Bit of a careless pass, almost knocked away. Gomez, Simpson at the top eight in the shot clock now. There's Gomez, into trouble, gets a shot away. Not off the board. Didn't get a piece of the rim, however, Julie Goodhouse rips it down there. It's a nine-point Durham lead. And this time, Warwick gets called for the foul. No doubt about that one, her second foul. The team's third. We 
talk about that differential foul situation. It's eight three right now. Eight fouls for Durham, three for Jordan Brown. We got to try to balance that out by working the ball and playing tough offensive ball. Well, the other thing is use the shot clock wisely. Use a lot of your teammates. There's Jazbeck Brown. Nice play inside. This time Heidi Brown follows through and hits her first bucket of the game. An outstanding play by Heidi Brown. Doesn't contribute all the scoring points of a forward in her position, but boy, when she makes them count, she scores the big buckets. There's also a nice pass from Jazbeck for the two. There's Wayne. Correction. Wayne rather got two Heidi's. Heidi Brown that time with an outstanding defensive play. And uh, Relentless defensive player, always known for her defensive prowess. And Heidi is really coming to the forefront here. 2.56 remaining in this game. Gomez fires a fastball into the crowd there. A little too hot to handle for Warwick. We'll see if uh, George Brown applies pressure, and they do. That time there, Cook tries to tip it. It's going to be George Brown ball. Well, so perhaps a good thing that she did tip it, because if she didn't, Simpson might have stolen and had a two-on-one opportunity. Now we're back into the half-court set. The only situation I can say right now, Matt, is George Brown really hasn't taken advantage of the opportunities they've had to get back into it. And that was an offensive foul there. The other thing, referee Dino Zano coming to the bench. An offensive foul, and it's going to go here against Sandries James. That's her second foul, team's fourth. Again, full court press, but one of the, one of the things I can mention, Ken, is George Brown in a bonus situation. They should be perhaps even aggressive here, having a chance to go to the foul line and stop the clock even. Here's Goodhouse, Jasbeck. Oh, tough there, trying whether to stop or dribble the ball. Jasbeck has a smile on her face. She knows it. <laughs> Good job by uh, Durham, textbook example of breaking the press. They did an excellent job there. Jasbeck just a little too over-aggressive. Took the extra step, 2.30 to go. Durham still leads by 11. Here's Warwick Simpson now. Gomez, hook on her. James fronts this side. And Heidi Brown there, call for a foul from behind the play, playing great D underneath. That time she signaled for a foul. That's just her second. But it's a bonus situation here. It stops the clock, and George Brown, Lori Peterson goes to the line. Peterson averaging uh, just over one point a game, 1.3 a game. I see a lot of action this season. In fact, that was her first trip to the line. First trip to the line of the season. Ball goes off Goodhouse, so she just couldn't get her hands on it. George Brown still has the ball. And again, a perfect example. George Brown not taking advantage of these free buckets when the clock is stopped, which is something they need. Warwick into James, triple team. That's not going to work. Here's Gomez, checked by Chawadi. And 20 seconds on the shot clock. Here's Warwick. Tough D by the Lady Lords are shutting down James. Oh, that one Prayer in. there by Charmaine <laughs> Warwick. A one-hand runner, something of the Alabama Fuzzy style. Doesn't go, it's going to come back to Durham here. Jasbeck had a good, good rebound there. 15 foul goes against George Brown. It goes against Joanne Gomez. And we take a look right now. Warren Rooney wants to come back in. The needle seems like it's okay, but just didn't get to the scorer's table in time. A little late in the substitution there. Couldn't quite get her in. Shawadi runs at the clock, runs under two minutes now. Here's Cook. They swing it wide. Goodhouse. Turnaround jumper. It goes. And Goodhouse with 27 on the game. Well above her season average. That's a 13-point Durham lead. Durham appears to be now comfortably moving along to a big victory here. 134 remaining. George Brown just can't solve the inside game right now. Well, come down to crunch time, Durham just played, you know, superior inside defense. What George Brown has to do is shoot. They can't pass the foul around like this, can they? got to shoot quickly, and they've got to foul and stop the clock. There's no doubt about that. Seven on the shot clock. They're in trouble now. Here's Simpson Warwick from three. She steps over for two, and she's fortunately picking up a foul here. Three seconds left on the shot clock. You're up by 13, just over a minute to go. You did a good job defensively for 27 seconds here. An excellent job, as a matter of fact. And then with three seconds to go, you have a foul. Here's Warwick at the line. Charmaine averaging just under 10 points a game, 60% from the line. She's 40 of 67 from the free throw line. In her third year with the Huskies. Warwick now at 10 points. Ties James for second after Rooney on the squad of the game. And she's good on both. Now we see the press again. They should foul quickly in this instance. 
And they they got to stop the clock here quickly with a foul. They haven't seen it yet. Good job of breaking the press again. Jasbeck on the far side. And since it steals it, she's got Warwick with her dishes off to Warwick, who lays it in left hand. 59.2 seconds to go. It's a nine-point lead. They got a foul here. No reason why they haven't yet. They have to foul because they got to score when the clock is stopped, and they're far from bonus. Uh, Goodhouse, not a good move by Goodhouse there. She should have pulled it out. Should have used it to the time limit. Used it to the time limit clock. You're ready. Time limit clock. You're ready. Exactly right, Kevin. In that situation there, Goodhouse had to pull the ball out. Elected to shoot it, lost the ball. As a result of two shots the opposite way, with the clock stopped at 40.4 seconds. At this point, the clock is certainly the ally of the Durham Lady Lords. Just over 40, 40.4 seconds ago. Durham should certainly use every bit of their 30-second shot clock and force George Brown to foul them. And fortunately for Goodhouse, off the mark there for Warwick, couldn't cut into the lead. And Warwick hits that one, eight-point lead. Here's a press again, 40 seconds. They got a foul here. Durham's got a good, good job breaking the press in this game. They do it once again. Oh, this time they elect to shoot again. Not what they wanted. Twice in a row, Durham has given the ball up. There's Simpson. Off the mark there. James tries to battle with it. And it's Durham ball. 18.5 seconds to go, Matt. Certainly nonetheless thrilling in the dying seconds here. Eight-point lead, Durham. They got a foul. But I understand why they haven't fouled yet. Here's Goodhouse now pulling it out. And they finally foul with 18, correction, 8.7 seconds remaining. George Brown electing not to foul. Well, I think that was a, a mistake on their part of a couple of minutes ago. They should have fouled. They should have stopped the clock. They should have forced, even if it meant sending them into the bonus situation, they should have made them make the points from, oh, excuse me, from the line. 8.7 seconds. Here's Shawati. Brown's going to run it down. They have foul now, 4.8. It's way too late for fouls. 4.8 seconds remaining. This one's going to be put in the books very shortly. It's Durham 49, George Brown 41. Heidi Brown will go to the line here, shooting one and one. Hey, Heidi Brown, a graduate of IE Weldon High School in Lindsay. No, no, she got two in a row. She got one. She got Brown's going to the line. One-on-one -on -one situation. Off the mark there, off James's hand. That's going to be Durham ball, 3.5 seconds remaining. And it's just a matter of seconds before this one's in the books. And a big Durham Lady Lords win in a must-win situation. They rose to the occasion. There's a foul, not called. Simpson, Goodhouse this time for three at the buzzer. It doesn't go on the Durham Lady Lords. Capture a big victory here. They're Losses. Nonetheless, a big win because it's a four-pointer against George Brown, who they're chasing for the sixth and final playoff spot. Durham now with a record of five and eight. George Brown drops to six and eight. Makes the game on February 22nd all that much more important. Now we talk about big games. Durham with probably the best game we've seen them play at home all year. Probably the coaching staff would attest. Probably their best overall game all season long. And it resulted in an eight-point win. It was a, a superb game. It's certainly the best game I've seen them play all this year, Ken. I'm not sure about yourself, but offensively and defensively. And a lot of balance. Goodhouse, of course, to start 27 points. But contributions from people like Jackie Green, Kathy Stasiak, Cindy Miller. Everyone came off the bench and did a super job. Well, no doubt about it. Julie Goodhouse, 27 points. She's uh, equal to her task as the leading scorer in the OCAA. But sure, certainly Jackie Green, Heidi Wayne, Heidi Brown, and Kathy Stasiak also hitting the score sheet. Not to mention Sharon Cook with a quick six points. They got out to a quick start. Coach That's Rainbow right. was happy with that. They finished strong in the second half. And Durham with an eight-point victory minus a couple of late turnovers. Maybe they were a little excited. They knew how big a game this was. But Durham with a few turnovers over the end, they overcame all of that to register a key victory, a must-win victory. Durham now five and eight. They now have a shot with a win against George Brown on February 22nd and a win against Seneca or Niagara. Three of four. 
They've now won one, so two of their next three games, one of the wins has to be against George Brown. Two of those wins out of three will probably get them the sixth spot. I'm sure will guarantee them the sixth spot and a playoff spot in the OCAA for the second consecutive year and a chance to qualify for the Final Four championships right here in March, on March 3 That's right, Kent. Those, those games, the upcoming games you mentioned, those are very doable for Durham. In fact, the, the victory that we just saw today against George Brown was the first time they beat a team ahead of them in the standings. They can certainly match up against these squads that they're playing and get those key victories that they need to get into the playoffs. Well, certainly, Kent. Durham, full value for that one. Their fifth win against eight losses. They'll be celebrating tonight at Durham with that key win. Stay tuned for the second half of our OCAA doubleheader. It's the George Brown men's team led by all-world Lester Jones, who's second in the East in scoring. We saw him at the All-Star game. He scored 40 or more points twice on the season. He's chasing the other man that's a marked man for Durham, number 40, Augusto Duquesne, none other than the number one scorer in the East. He leads the entire OCAA in scoring. In fact, Augusto and Lester are 1-2 in the entire OCAA, including East and West. That's coming up shortly in our second half of today's OCAA Rogers Community 10 broadcast of college basketball action. My name is Ken Babcock. For Matt Ackler, we'll be back shortly with a tip-off and a preview to today's second game featuring George Brown College and Durham. Do you have an upcoming sporting event that you'd like advertised free of charge? Well, you can get your message into almost 74,000 homes across Durham on the Goal Line Upcoming Events Billboard. Just call Tom at 436-4141 or leave your name and phone number on the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500 and we'll get back to you. It's as easy as a phone call and there's no charge. The Goal Line Upcoming Events Billboard, only on Durham Region's Spirit of Sport. Goal Line. Get with the program. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line. College Athletic Complex moments away from tip-off for a second game, and we'd like to welcome the Glenn Dew Senior Public School Choir and their rendition of our national anthem. Senior Public School Choir, Matt. We're set for action here. Game two of our doubleheader today featuring the George Brown Huskies and the Durham Lords and George Brown coming into the game right now with a bit of a struggle. They did come up with a big two-point victory against Cambrian College just last week to move up in the standings. 
Durham College bouncing off a tough, heartbreaking three-point loss at the hands of Algonquin this past Friday. We all saw a jam-packed house here right down to the dying seconds. Six and a half seconds to go before it was decided, and Durham goes down on foul shot 79-76. Durham with a record of six wins and two losses, and George Brown College right now at three and six. Definitely the underdog in this one, Matt. We'll see what happens today. Well, for, for basketball fans who like high-scoring action, we've got, the, as you mentioned earlier in, our, in the first game of this doubleheader, the two top scorers in the OCAA East. In fact, all of OCAA, Augusto DeCanzi, of course, we've seen many times, but we have a great chance to see Lester Jones, who averages about almost as much as Augusto at 27 points a game. Uh, three and six is George Brown's record. They're kind of in the situation that the Durham Lady Lords were in, having to battle, having to win the remainder of the game. So they'll be all out. They'll be fighting the, the Durham Lords the rest of the whole game for sure. Well, certainly the battle today, not only Durham against George Brown, but Augusto de Kesti, the number one scorer in the East, just under 30 points a game. The number two scorer in the East, Lester Jones. And we talk about talk about leading scorers right now. Augusto de Kesti leading the way right now for all scorers in the OCAA. Augusto, as you see, Ken, 28.3 points a game. Lester falling very closely behind, 27.4. A couple of the Algonquin stars who we saw here in OCAA All-Star action. Pat Johnson, of course, also from Durham is right up there in Sherlock Chance. We'll also see see with some uh, action tonight's game, no doubt about that. A lot of a lot of high scores in the OCAA, some of the best scores, Augusto and Lester leading the leading the brigade in that department. Well Durham with uh, two wins in the remaining part of the season will clinch a playoff spot, which they want to host a playoff spot. Right now they're pretty well settling for second place right now after losing there are only two games of the year at the hands of the Algonquin Thunder. A thrilling game last Friday right here. But uh, nonetheless, George Brown, the opposition tonight, and Lester Jones, an outstanding player. We all saw him at the All-Star Games. He's wearing a different number than he did at the All-Star Games. But he certainly knows how to shoot the ball the same way. Lester Jones opens the scoring, number 23, for the Durham Lords. And uh, okay, not a good start for Durham defensively. Gave him three opportunities. George Brown did an excellent job crashing the boards. Let's see if they can make up for that. And Kenry Hopkinson here, nursing a sore back. Played most of the game Friday, right back in the action as a starter. There's Patrick Johnson off the mark. Sherlon Chance quickly grabs the rebound and tries to see familiar number 40, Augusto de Kesti, under the basket. But Jones played a little defense there, and he knew Augusto was going right to the basket as a smart offensive scoring machine does and uh, Jones tipped it away, still Durham ball. Right now it's Rick Jordan, Patrick Johnson, Kenrick Hopkinson, Chance, and Augusto Duquesne on the court. Durham wearing their home white uniforms. Here's Duquesne, big mismatch against Jones. Johnson rebound. Off the glass and in, and Patrick Johnson opens the scoring for the Lords. We're tied at two. George Brown had about three opportunities on the offensive boards, and Durham came right back at them to do the exact same thing to tie the game. Nice bucket there, all the way in, but couldn't finish it off. Was number 14, Tony Keith. Here's Johnson, one on one. Huge mismatch against Keith. Can't win the battle there. Duquesne steals it. Top of the key, can't get it to go. Duquesne off the mark. And number 32 for the Huskies, a familiar face, Stafford Kerr with the ball. There's Jones Kerr this time lost chance of the ball. He'll slow it down and give the ball up here to Hopkins in the quarterback of the Durham Lords offense, wearing number 21. Would you run down the George Brown starters for our fans not familiar with this team? 15, Gat Fullmutter, 23, Lester Jones, we've talked about already. Number 14, Tony Anthony. Oral Anthony is actually his name, but his buddies call him Tony. I was told. Number 31, Keith Jofield, and number 32, Stafford Kerr. into the game. Game is all tied also at 2-2-2. Two, two, two. Uh, Augusto going to the line here. 88.1% from the line. 37-42. to 42. Doesn't miss very often. Augusto with his first points of the game. 3-2 Durham leads. Can Augusto perhaps in a bit of a slump at the line? He was hovering that 95-96% mark and now he's dropped all the way down to 88%. What a drop for Augusto. Definitely a slump. Boy, oh boy. Augusto missing an average of one every 15 foul shots. Leading the way in the OCAA. If he continues this pace, he'll set a record in the OCAA for foul shoot, shooting percentage during the regular season. When we talk about foul shooting, the Durham Lords as a team are the 
Verge of possibly breaking the all-time season record, which is about 74 percent. Durham just behind at 73 percent. They were up at the 80 percent range to start the season in the first half of the year. Here's Lester Jones, Patrick Johnson drawing the assignment against Lester, winning the battle this time. Augusto with a rebound, Hopkinson there. We see Patrick Johnson battling against Lester Jones. Coach Kerry Vincent has assigned Johnson the task of covering Lester Jones, one of the premier offensive players in the league. McKesney's soft touch always finds a magnet to pull it through the bottom of the hoop. And McKesney's there. Jordan full court press now. Here's Durham's press. Trapping press as they look to trap the ball. Almost got to it there. Hormat a nice spin dribble. Stafford curveball on the floor, picks it up again, finds room. It's going to go, and a foul. That's going to go look like, uh, to me, to be against Sherlock Chance. And it is his first. Good call, good call Ken. It's interesting, the matchup we talked about, Jones to Kesley. Yes, he mentioned Pat Johnson guarding Lester Jones, the top scorer, but when they go the other end, Jones is taking the toughest defensive job there is against her, which is guarding Augusto. Curve for the chance for the three-point play to cut this lead from six to four to it's still six four. He misses it. Rebounds. Uh, just can't hold on by Augusto. Out of bounds. George Brown ball. We'll take a look now at the East Division standings. Of course, Algonquin leading. Second place, six and two. That big game on the weekend on Friday night. Algonquin nine and zero. Oh. And we take a look, the top four teams in East Division make the playoffs. Humber College leading the way. They're only lost. They're number one in the country still. St. Clair is surprised. St. Clair College has slipped into second place. And we take a look at the East and West standings here. Sheridan at 6-2. and two. Fanshawe 5-4. and four. The top four teams make it to the playoffs in a quarterfinal situation. Durham looks like they'll finish second. If so, and it looks like they will finish second, Durham College will host the number three place team in a sudden death playoff game on Tuesday, February 28th, right here at the Durham College Athletic Complex. And we know there are three strong teams in the OCAA. It's Humber at 7-1, St. Clair at 8-2, and, and Sheridan at 6-2. So certainly whoever finishes the third place who comes down here to the Durham College Complex will be a great matchup between the Lords and whoever comes out of the West in the third spot. Still 6-4, George Brown looking to go deep, nothing open. The curve brings up the ball. Tight game in the early going here. And Chance, full court press. Outstanding game Chance had Friday night with 18 points. Patrick Johnson also with a big game. And that's Chance, the second foul. Not what Coach Vincent wanted in the early going. Well, Durham's tough. third team foul this half. Tough job guarding Stafford Courage. Third on the team in scoring 12.6 points a game. Second amongst the athletes who are here today. Second leading scorer at 19.5 points a game. Abdo Chidiak just didn't make the trip down from George Brown Compass in downtown Toronto. They'll try it again in the inbounds here. Stafford to throw the ball in. Go! They do get the ball in. Kenrick Hopkinson got a piece of it, no less, but it goes for two. Gad Permutter with that one. He gets the ball to go for two. We're tied at six here. 16-31 remaining in the first half. Here's Johnson, freezes the ball. They gotta see Durham move the ball a little more. Johnson, big mismatch. Gets the ball to go this time. Up and over his man, number 14, Tony Orl. And Johnson hits for the bucket. He has four on the game. It's a two-point Lord's lead. Oh, nice drive there, Stafford Kerr driving the lane, finding space between the white jerseys and laying it in. That was just speed and quickness on the part of Kerr. We've seen him as the most impressive player so far, not just for George Brown, but in this game. There's the matchup, Duquesne Jones, and this time Duquesne goes up and over. He's got six, and the Lords lead by two. Here's Permutter at the top. Shows oh, completely stolen away there. Hopkinson so quick. 
sees the rest of his guys, takes the ball up strong. He's going to draw the foul against Permutter, and Kendrick Hopkinson will go to the line to shoot two. Hopkinson did a nice job there, first of all, of course, stealing the ball. But when he saw his teammates coming up, Permutter was defending him, and he thought he was going to pass it off to the trailer. But Kendrick Hopkinson, being the smart player he is, he took it right to the basket and drew the foul. Certainly, Hopkinson is hero. Isaiah Thomas, no stranger to that, in the recent article in the school newspaper here, itemizing uh, how much he uh, endeared Isaiah Thomas as his uh, as his idol watching basketball, his dedication and all-around skills, and uh, Kenrick certainly coming to the forefront in just his second season here at Durham, an all-star representative at the all-star game, representing Durham College, and one of the premier point guards in the OCAA. This is both free throws, huh? Stolen away there. Duquesne certainly knows where the ball is. He'll shoot two. Nothing but net there as he bounces it in off the rim. And Augusto, as usual, quick starts. Eight points on the game. We talk about fast starts for Augusto. Friday night, Duquesne missing practice, uh, late for practice, rather, in the coach's policy on practices. The fact that uh, he must sit out. He sat out the first nine minutes and didn't start on Friday night. And knowing Augusto's quick starts, he's averaged about 19 points a game in the first half. That probably would have told a different story Friday night. Tony Anthony collecting his first personal foul. Tony Anthony foul number 43. Matt Johnson pouring the line. Johnson and Augusto Duquesne so far the only players who've scored for Durham College. Johnson now with five points and Duquesne with eight. Here's Johnson again. Graduate of Oakwood Collegiate in Toronto. He drains two. He's got six, and the Lords lead by six. Stolen there, Jordan. Sees Duquesne. Bounce pass a little bit behind him, but he manages to keep his fingers on it. So tough is Duquesne to stop. He's got 10. And the Lords pull into an eight-point lead here in the first half. Well, Augusta's warming up. He's got 10 now. we just played about five and a half minutes. And Augusto is slipping in, really improving his defensive game over the second half. Coach Vincent working hard with him, as his assistant coach, Gord Wallace, at practice is working hard with Duquesne's defense. They call him from all the way across the gym. Head coach Kerry Vincent prides himself and all of his teams he's ever coached on their strong defensive play, screaming good help, good help. As you mentioned, Augusto improved in that department, especially demonstrated right there. The Rick Jordan subbing out of the game. It's sure a chance as well to take a quick breather. Jordan picking up that last foul, his second. Into the game, number 55, John Tate. And number 11, Adam Esterbrook, so strong off the bench, both these players. Lester Jones can't make the mark there. Esterbrook's at the ball. Sees Duquesne, he's got a partial break. He's going to take it straight down and right down. A little bit different flavor, right hand jam, and Duquesne lights it up. He's got 12 in the first half. Here's Jones now against Tate. Tough task for Jones. He gets the bucket to go, unusual shooting touch, but works so well. Twice this season, Jones has lit it up for more than 40 points, including 43 against Loyalist two weeks ago. There's Duquesne on fire. And once he's on fire, Matt, there's no stopping him. 14 now in the first half. Well, Lords this, now with a big 10-point lead, their biggest of the game. In this head-to-head -head battle of Jones and Duquesne, so far it's all Augusto, 14, 4 for Lester Jones. Definite height advantage, definite height advantage. Duquesne chasing, stolen from behind there is Duquesne. All alone now, Johnson with him, two on one. Johnson fakes it, Duquesne with the rebound, and Duquesne draws the foul. And Duquesne is going to go to the line with a big smile on his face here. He's going to go to the line here for two shots. I guess it was doing a, doing a very clever thing there with this, the uh, turnover or the steal or the defensive rebound by one of his teammates is picked up. He's going for the fast break. You, think, you don't have the big 6'8", the big 6'9 guys leading the break, but I guess it was doing just that, showing his all-around skills. Lester Jones checking out now to catch a breather here and certainly find the tough going with both Tate and DeKesney guarding him. Not the kind of assignments Jones has been matched up to. Threw him with a definite height advantage in this game. Augusto going the line, 37 of 42 on the season coming into the game. He made two for two earlier today. Now three for three. 15 points for Augusto. 
We haven't even played seven minutes yet. I guess we're off to his typical fast start. 21-10, Durham leads here in the first half. And two more. Four of four from the line. Now over the 90% mark on the season. Double team trapped there. Good job by Esther Brooks also. Talk about Durham, number one defensive team in the league. We saw that, right. We'll see those stats a little bit later on in the second half. But during this telecast, Esther Brooks to inbounds. 12-point Durham lead. They're so explosive when they get on a run. Johnson trying to pull away. It's a foul there against number 22 of the Huskies. And that's Jason Birch. That's his first. Look and like, team's fifth. So it can look like Johnson's trying to force something there. Really. He had uh, he picked up his dribble, but he kept on faking, stayed with it. Didn't have a teammate to help him out. So he went up strong and was fouled by Birch. Still a two-man game here for uh, for the Durham Lords. Augusto with 16 points. Pat Johnson now with seven. 13-01 remaining in the first half. Johnson hits both. Here comes a double team in the corner. And Johnson picks up that foul. Stafford Kerr with the ball on the sideline. Patrick's first, team's fifth, and they'll inbounds again. Pressure on D here, Adam Esterbrooks. Gusto's man gets free. Stolen away, Dunster Log tips it away. Kendrick Hopkins in with a nice dish. And another bucket there, Augusto to Kessley with 18 points in the first half. And Augusto showing a little bit of that cat-like quickness for a big guy. Oh, what a, a steal by knocking the ball upwards instead of downwards. Steal Hopkinson, Hopkinson right back. Long pass to Kesty, wide open. Is this exciting hoops or what? The Kesty lays it in. He's got 20 in the first half. We've only played seven and a half minutes. The Kesty with 20 points already. And what a play by Kenrick Hopkinson coming back to steal it and finding him wide open. Augusto this time, hold the shot off that time. We saw that. He did pass the ball. Make note. Wisely setting it up this time. And we got a slot foul there. Not a very smart foul by Birch. His second. That's the team six. We're close to bonus here. We've only played eight minutes. What we've seen so far is that George Brown just can't handle the press. They're going to talk about it in timeout right here. And we do have a timeout on the floor. We're going to take a break here. 12 13 remaining in the first half. You're watching OCAA college basketball action on Rogers Community 10. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. Twelve thirteen remaining, 28-10. It was a close game at the start, 6-all. Durham's pulled away since then, going on a huge, right, we would call it a huge, a huge 22-point run. And uh, George Brown mustering just four points, 22-4 over the last six minutes. And uh, we see Durham taking control of this game. Augusto de Kessie, 20 points already in the game. The Durham College single-season game record set in 1973. We've said it before. He's been close. Is 39 points set by Bob Burley in 73. The 22-year-old record might risk falling tonight with the with 20 points already in the first eight minutes. Yeah, it seems that all of our fans out there know all the history of Bob Burley every time we're here. Augusto's in the <laughs> threat of breaking that record. Hawkinson with the ball. Plenty of time on the shot clock. Duquesne, nice pass there. That one doesn't go. Unusual for a miss from one feet. Here is the ball coming the opposite way with Jason Birch. Almost a travel there by Birch. Nice bucket inside. His first bucket of the game. Keith Jofield makes it. And that lights up the board on the George Brown side that was stuck for some time. Here's Tate. Estabrooks one on one against Birch. Nice dish inside. A big mismatch for DeKesty. He can't get it to go. Marchetti. And Furwater with the ball. Marchetti grabbed the rebound there. 
All blue under the basket. This time, Durham was not attacking the boards. They swing it out again. Here's Birch from three. He hits for three. Jason Birch, his first bucket, a big three. Birch shot that with confidence. One of the top three-point shooters on the team. Six so far in the season. Second behind Perlmutter. Here's Hopkinson. A little bit of offensive move there. Shake and bake from Hopkinson. He gets it to drop for two. That's a 15-point Lord's lead, first half. And finally, someone other than DeKesney or Pat Johnson gets on the board for Durham. Johnson and DeKesney, as you mentioned, accounting for all the Lord's scoring until that point. Augusto with 20 of them. Patrick Johnson opening the game with six. Off the mark there, just short, big rebound, short, big rebound, though, it's going to go. I think Birch is not afraid to pull the trigger from just about anywhere. That was well beyond the three-point stripe. Fronted out, but Stafford Kerr went straight to the... That one's going to go against the rim, the there. Picks up the foul as first. And Augusto checks out right now for breather with 20 points. As does Patrick Johnson into the game now. Star of Friday night's game with three key three-pointers in the dying seconds. Ray for Perret. And also into the game now, wearing number 33, David Pickering. Ray for Perry and Mike Kosavik exchanging three-pointers three consecutive times down the court on Friday. What a game that was. Kerr makes a bucket for the three-point play. He now leads George Brown with seven points. Certainly at Coronation Public School, Ray for Perry is the star of the day. I think they wanted to take him home with them after the game, signing autographs and certainly thrilled with Ray for Perry. He spent some time after the game talking with the young players and young students from Coronation Public School who were in attendance that night. Nice move inside by Tate there, Ken. Showed he's got some moves with Augusto on the bench. John Tate with a bucket there, averaging seven a game, certainly doing a great job playing the number two spot behind Augusto. Just no easy task. Tate, a wonderful offensive talent. Look for him to improve each game out. Adam Esterbrook's big hand in there. Got a lot of ball. Esterbrook is one of the most tenacious defenders, one of the most crafty defensive players in the OCAA. He can really play this game in a number of different styles. Forced to turn over right there with his quick hands and quick feet. Here's Hopkinson here. Esterbrook's turnaround jumper. John White. That time... Correction, John Tate. Correction on that. Ball goes off the side. Estabrooks to keep it alive. Estabrooks turn around jumper. He hits. Now, Matt, you're seeing, as we mentioned, some other guys contributing now. Augusto's out. The Lords just keep coming at you with so many offensive weapons. Well, they're a, a team with great depth, and we're seeing that so far in the first half. Lester Jones handling the ball smoothly. Lester, well, this time, Tate wins the battle. And back comes Hopkinson. 16-point Lords lead. Didn't go there. Perry just off the mark for three. It's going to stay Durham ball. 8.44 remaining in the first half. And checking back into the game is Tony Anthony, number 14. Good job by Dave Pickling, we should point out there. Can he uh, hustle up the boards and went off the uh, George Brown player, namely Durham to keep possession. A little different setup here with four players lining up across the free throw line. Esther Brooks inbounding. So let's see what happens. There's Ray for Perry again on the board. Tate battles, and it's won that time by Joe Field. In the air, commits early. Save just barely in the line. Swing it back out per mutter at the baseline. It's going to go again. He likes that spot. He's got four on the game, both from that area. Nice move by Perlmutter. Good follow through. And, of course, a nothing but net shot. Ed in. Four points for Perlmutter. Perry's handing now the ball at the top of the key. Down Hopkinson on the side. Pickering swings across. There's Jones ripping that one down off the glass. Clean lane there. Wisely dishes off. Opposite side this time. Jones gets a piece of it. Esther Brooks comes away. And back come the Lords. And they slow it down. Give it to their general back there, Kendrick Hopkinson. 14-point Lords lead. Rafer Perry now with the ball. Here's Esther Brooks from three. He's going to get that to go. 
Adam Estabrooks for three. He's got five on the game. That's the first Durham three-pointer of the game. Maybe not the person you have suspected to do it, but Estabrooks can certainly hit that shot. Stolen away here. Shot clock ticks at 11. Jones against Tate. Helped by Pickering. Nice help, and it does the job, but a great tip and a great follow there by Joe Field. He's got four on the game. In that situation with a the switch, there was a mismatch. Perry was forced to defend Joe Field. He's just not big enough to keep it more than The substitutions here we see coming out of the court, seeing their first action. Number 30, Gary Oak, always working hard, always the last guy, along with David Pickering at practice, always the first guys there, always the last ones to leave. And also wearing number 12, Brian Allward, all the way from Newfoundland, in his first year joining the team at Christmas, joining the team in the business admit program. And Brian seeing some court time. A quick guard and a nice acquisition for Coach Vincent and his squad to bolster the guards and add a little depth off the bench. Tate did a nice defensive job against Jones there. Nestor Brooks allowed only one shot for the Huskies. Here's Oak, one-on-one. -on -one, pops it back out to Perry. Oak again, turnaround jumper. Tough D there. Jones is going to come away with it. As well, the Huskies. Uh, Joe Field doesn't get it to go there. In and out. Perry takes control. Perry playing the one spot now. Hopkinson sitting down for a breather. And Billy LaRon getting ready to check in for the Lords. It's good to see the versatility of someone like Rafer Perry, known for his shooting primarily, but right now, Ken, as you mentioned, handling the point guard duties. Johnny Tate, two shots at it. That's the defensive back. And Gary Oak has it now. And Tate's going to hang on to it and set up their half-court offense. Esther Brooks nicely done off the glass. Turned around jumper, and Esther Brooks now with seven. And when he's hot, the Lords are usually hot. Nice job off the bench by Estabrooks. 39-22, Durham leads. Off the mark there, both he and John Tate combining for nine points off the bench for the Lords. And the Huskies appear tired right now. Not a deep bench for Coach Willie Dellis and his squad. Certainly feeling the paces of this quick action and quick pace Lord's team would like to run the floor. Well, it's one of the strengths and of Durham, and certainly Coach Kerry Vinson likes to use that to his advantage, the depth of this team, and wearing his opponents down. That well, was tipped away. It was off with Jones's hand, tipped off. The referee sees it the other way. It's going to stay Huskies ball. Tate just got a finger on that as it went by. Jones might have got it as well, but the possession is in favor of George Brown. Tony Anthony will be in inbounding the ball on the far side of the court. Here's Birch, Villaron now in the game, as we mentioned, number 23. So quick on D, ever quick. Had a call from the baseline out of nowhere. Peter Steichak making the call here. It's going to go against Brian Allward. Allward call for the push in the sideline. Number six. The team fouls for Durham. Correction, rather, looks like number seven. And it just goes up late on the clock now, number seven, and that'll be a bonus situation for the Huskies. A much needed opportunity here, Coach Dellis, to pick up some points here with the clock stopped. It's 39-22, 5-11 remaining in the first half. Anthony will be going to the line. You have 50% free throw shooter on the season. This is the one and one. Ken, as you know, if he makes the first one, he gets the second one. If not, the ball's in play and action resumes. Makes it cleanly his first point of the game. There are now six different Huskies on the board. And Anthony is clean on both of them, two for two. It's now 39 24, 15 point lead for Durham. That one goes off Tate's hands, I don't know, it's too hot to handle. 5 one remaining, it's a 15-point Lord's lead. And full-court pressure, Bill LaRon now. Perry looking to trap, they always look to trap. He's got to get over half here first. Perry helps out, Birch having a tough time getting the ball over half. Oh, good job by Bill LaRon of, on defense, forcing the ball. Nice move baseline there. Joe Field smooth to the baseline and drives it home. Joe Field now with six on the game. 
And the Huskies cut it to 13. Tofield, a lanky fellow, all arms and legs coming towards the basket there, but a nice move around the baseline. Nice pass inside. Bill will run to Tate. The bucket goes. Tate hits the second bucket of the game, and he's going to go to the line for one more. Well, that was a super play, Ken, right there by Allward and John Tate going to the bucket. Tate, the biggest man out there. No one's really able to defend him at this point from the George Brown side. He had his hand up, showed the target, and Allward hit it right on the money. Tate now with four points, chance to make it a three-point play. Tate about a 67% free throw shooter on the season. As you know, can only join the team up to the second half. So doesn't have a lot of opportunities. Off the mark there. Back comes George Brown. However, Tate playing excellent defense, picks it off. Howard with the ball. He has it now. It's a partial three on two, and he wisely holds up, and they set up to half court. 412 remaining, first half. Here's Tate. One on one. Gives it up to Perry. He drives it in and smooth movement inside. And Reefer Perry with the play of the night so far. Well, that was a and the Huskies throw it away. Full court pressure Perry. too much for the Huskies on that one. What but, a basket by Perry. Oh, that was just super great athletic ability showed by there by Reefer Perry. Perry averaging 10 points a game. None better than that one. Here's Tate Jones supposed to get way outside. Brian Allward inside, gets his own rebound, and right back up and in. And Brian hits the score sheet. Allward, if we, for the record books, just recorded his first bucket as a Durham Lord. Just joining the team in January, not seeing a lot of time. Seeing more time now as he gets back into the system and learns the Durham system offensively and defensively, and it's his first bucket. And it's one that he can be proud of because he went straight after his own offensive rebound and took advantage of the smaller opponent. Tate. John Tate, too much air. Perry led the way in a dish nicely. The Huskies turn it over again. And I smell a timeout brewing here for the Huskies with 317 remaining. No sign of it yet, but the Lords lead now quickly. It was a 13-point game. We can run now 47-26. A 21-point lead. OCAA East, Algonquin leading, as we talked earlier, 9-0, and yet to lose this season. Durham right behind his 6-2. As again, those only two losses against Algonquin Thunder from Ottawa. And while we were aware, Billy LeRon hit a bucket there now, and it's 23 points on the plus side for the Lords. Jones right at John Tate. He gets that one to go. What a player Lester Jones is. Six points. 46 remaining in the first half. Sorry, Ken Lester Jones has been pretty quiet. We talked about what an explosive score he is, but he's held to six so far. And it's a credit really to the Durham defense with the Kessney and Patrick Johnson drawing the assignment, doing a good job now, John Tate. And he's really finding it tough going to get those uh, quality shots open. There's Tate Perry for three, his favorite spot. Howard, big boards there, helped with Gary Oak, tried to get it to build a run. And Rafer Perry going to be called for a pushing foul there. Can't even, you may not know this, but what we've got on the court here for Durham is all bench players, and they've built up this lead that these starters had set for them. So that's, that's a real testimony to the quality of the, and the depth that Durham has in this team that Coach Kerry Vincent can use in a variety of ways, all big, all small, all quick. Rafer Perry is called with foul there, his first Perlmutter are going to line in the one-and-one one situation. This will go there. Joe Field, big rebound. He's had a big game so far. That's number eight on the point column for Keith Joe Field, number 31. 19-point lead. We're approaching the two-minute mark of the first half. Tate runs it down with his long arm, snags that one going that by. Again, that pass wasn't for Tate. I think it was for Billy Leron. I don't think so. All went off his hands. Tries to get it back, doesn't. Had it for a chance. It stays Huskies ball. And uh, we're under two minutes now, first half. The Lords started slowly, but so explosive. And uh, DeKesney and Johnson and Chance and uh, Henry Hopkins have now been out most of the first half since that big run. They've now sat out the last seven minutes. One of the keys is that uh, George Brown has just not been able to handle the press primarily. They did a good job there. Oh, they've had too many turnovers otherwise. It just shows the kind of strength Durham has. Two starting lives that can go, and they can sub guys in freely. Coach Vincent, Coach Wallace, the liberty to do that, and they're really getting uh, no less of output from the guys they're in now. And Tate so strong off the bench. That time a little strong with the shot, but a little strong off the bench. Almost Back on the Huskies. Almost broke the glass on that one. Tate grabbed him there, thought he drew a foul, even gave up on it. Here's Allworth. 
And the Lords come back. It's running good time now with 110 remaining first half. I imagine we'll see this bench, the five players on the court now for Durham Bell, bench players, finish out the half because they've done such a good job. Tate's like in the outside range with a nice cushion. Coach Vincent probably would like to see that. Alward chases it down. Great hustle there. Applaud from the bench there as they see him. Uh, he's okay. He hustles back in. Great hustle by Brian Alward. That's not the first time we've seen great hustle by Alward. It's about the third or fourth time I can count at least. Brian Alward has gone right after the ball and sacrificed his body just as he did right there going into the bench. Here at the top, here's Jones. Tate drawing the assignment this time. Jones straight to the hole, and he rolls it home for eight. Eight points on the game. Far cry from his 27 a game. He's been averaging in uh, big credit to the Durham Lords and their defense. Well, that, that shot that Jones just made is really tough to stop. If he can maintain that, he'll, he'll get back on the scoring pace, but really hard to, to stop that one. Gary Oak down low. A lot of weapons for the Durham Lords, especially in the low post position. Gary Oak's going to go to the line here. Joe Fields collects his third first Big foul. Gary Oak, six foot six, business and student from Port Hope, Ontario. And again, uh, we just saw where his first bucket as the Durham Lord, Gary Oak, with his first free throw attempt for the season. Shooting one and one here, hoping to make the first one here and hit the 50 mark for the Lords. And they do. They reach the half century mark at 50. George Brown at 32. And Oak looks to lead to that right now and increase the Durham lead. It's interesting that we talk about the depth. Durham already has nine players on the scoreboard, yet to score Sherlon Chance, Dave Pickering, and Rick Jordan. Players, two of them, in fact, are starters. Outstanding depth. They drive the lane there. Stafford Kerr makes a bucket. 20 seconds now remaining. And Rayford Perry will bring it up court. Shot clock not a factor. Rayford Perry slows it down the corner. Here's Alward. Dishes back Tate, elects not to shoot, six seconds now, Perry drives, and he's fouled, and amazingly, Perry looked to pass, looked to shoot, drew the foul, still got the shot away, the bucket went, great for Perry with three and a half seconds remaining in the first half, we'll go to the line to add one more, what a player. Yeah, great for Perry has made, he's only scored four points, two uh, free field goals, but two of the most memorable field goals we've certainly seen, the great uh, drive to the basket before, and this one with a hang time to hang up in the air as he's fouled, make the basket, and chance for a three-point play. Perry hits the bucket there. Ray for a graduate of Lamaru Secondary School in Toronto, in Scarborough, rather. His hometown, two seconds now at the buzzer, off the back iron, and does it go for Stafford Kerr. We're at halftime now. This OCAA basketball game, 53. The high score of the game at the half, it's Durham 53, George Brown 34. Matt, what, what can we expect George Brown to come in at halftime before we head away from the break? Well, the first thing they're going to have to do is uh, handle the ball better when they're being pressed. If they can't handle that, they're going to see the press the rest of the time, and this game could be over quickly in the second half. We know Durham's very explosive, but it was the, the, uh, the pressing defense that was the key for Durham to get the lead. Uh, Lester Jones certainly a factor all season long. He's only had eight the first half. Duquesne is partner in the scoring race and partner crime as they battle against each other, let alone the teams has 20. The factor of the game, Durham, with nine guys on the score sheet. The Lords lead right now 53-34. we got second half action coming up soon on this Rogers Community 10 broadcast of OCAA Basketball. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. Second half action here at the Durham College Athletic Complex. Durham 53, George Brown 34. We're presenting at this time uh, is something that Durham College gets quite involved with and a, a former special athlete here who passed away three years ago of a long battle with Hodgkinson's disease, Rob Burnett. 
and his family, uh, his wife Kim and uh, Rob's father here, also no stranger to the Burnett family, uh, quite a celebrity family nonetheless. George Burnett seen behind the bench of uh, the Edmonton Oilers as head coach, but tonight a special night at Durham College. Dino Azano from Don Cherry's Grave Find, the owner and operator and general manager, here to present along with Paul Doucette as MC the Rob Burnett Memorial Scholarship Award. This year to two more deserving individuals I can't see on the Durham Lords team. The award goes to a member of the men's basketball team each year who exemplifies dedication and leadership and all the, the tributes that Rob made so special. They were the first guy to practice, last guy to leave, always in the gym. And that goes to two players this year, a tie this year, and it goes to David Pickering and Gary Oak of the Durham Lords. This year's Rob Bennett. Memorial Scholarship recipients and two better guys, I don't know. Well, I, I couldn't think of any, Ken. Congratulations to both Dave and to Gary for uh, all their hard work and dedication in receiving this great award. Special award, special night here. We're going to take a look at some of the stats around the league. First of all, with the East scoring leaders and then a trip around the OCAA. We've also got some great stats later on. As we see, here's the Gust Augusto DeCastney, 28.3 points per game. Well, these are two fellows we talked about at the top of the broadcast. Augusto, 28, and Lester falling behind at 27.4. Ironically, in this head-to-head -head matchup, Lester's held to eight points in the first half. Let's see what happens. And of course, also Pat Johnson, they were 16.8 points well, per game. Augusto leading the way at 20 in the first half. Lester Jones held to eight with Johnson, DeCastney, and John Tate doing a great job defensively against him. We're set to second half action. It's Johnson, Jordan, Johnson off the iron there. Duquesne, Chance, and Kendrick Hawkinson. Hawkinson steals that one, goes all the way back so quick and takes the ball right off him. There's Duquesne. A little rough off the board there. Chance sort of bumped into him going by, causing Duquesne to miss it. And they both had a smile on their face. Here's Stafford Kerr left open. Big time leaper there, Kerr Jones at the rebound, only eight points in the first half, averaging 27 a game. He opens the second half, and I'm sure Coach Dell has probably mentioned to him a little bit that, hey, we need to start lighting it up. Unless there's a man to do that, we, we just saw the scoring, 27 points a game, now at 10, finally into double digits. He's now leading the team in scoring the game, nine points for Stafford Kerr and eight for Kevin Jofield along the way. Here's Hopkinson. Chance to spread it out now. Nine in the shot clock. Here's Jordan. Favorite spot from 15 feet. It doesn't go. And back on the Huskies. And that one falls there. Number 14, Anthony Tony. Tony Anthony, as you see right there, his first points of the half, four for the game. Hobbinson just blows by the defender. Here's Johnson, one-on-one, -on -one. big mismatch there. Off the glass, DeKesney rips it down, right back up, fingertips at home. DeKesney, 22 in the game, he had 20 in the first half. They've now played two minutes in the second half. Let's take a look at Coach Kerry Vincent here, approaching the 120 win mark. He has 118 career wins right now in the OCAA, including league and playoff. And last year won his 100th career OCAA game, a special moment for him. A large part of those at Canador in North Bay, but certainly uh, made his presence felt just his second year. He took his team to the Final Four year one. This is year two, they're ranked number eight in the country. And coming out of that Final Four held at Algonquin, Durham College took home the bronze medal. They're looking for even greater results this year. George Brown playing a strong opening to the second half, and this lead's cut to 15, 55-40. Here's Kenrick Hopkinson now, guarded closely, right to the hoop, wide open. He's going to lay it in for two, and Kenrick now has four points on the game. Hopkinson on the season, averaging 3.8. He's equal to season high, but certainly Kenrick's value isn't as a scorer. That's an over and back call there. Great D by Duquesne. Excellent help by Patrick Jones. There's a, quite a double team, especially for one of the smaller men out there, Perlmutter. Uh, Augusto 6-8 and Pat Johnson about 6-4, 6-5, double teaming him. He really got into trouble and was forced to step over the line. Rick Jordan back to Hopkinson. Next break, we're going to take a look at an unusual stat. Defensively, the Durham Lords leading the OCAA in defense. And average points allowed per game. We'll take a look at that before the next break. Here's Hopkinson. Three fakes. Jones up in the air and down. And Hopkinson now has six on the game. His season high is 14. 
Hopkins just steals again. He'll take it right in. Lay it in for two. He's got six in the second half and eight points on the game. Kenrick Hopkins and Show. They, that's exactly what I was going to say. Ken Hopkins and Show has started. We'll see who else is going to get into the show. Who's going to be his, his second mates? No basket by Jones. Doesn't count. Foul took place before his drive to the bucket. You see, deep. Defense, the name They're of the game. We're talking about defensive so stats right here. Right up the top, Durham, 72.7. A lot of game. the lowest. They have a three-point balls on Humber. You see the top teams, Humber, Algonquin, Sheridan, Seneca at 78. The worst team in the league at 89, Mohawk College of the 14 Division I schools. Durham clearly indicating they're the number one defensive team in the league. Well, no doubt, because we see the top four defensive teams there, they're probably the top four teams in the league. Defense wins games and championships. Mohawk, not surprising, the lowest, or the, the highest points given up. They're also 0-8 on the season. In fact, defensively, the Durham Lord is so strong. This year, it's 72.7, just that allowed per game. Durham allowing just 69 points a game during the 1993-94 college campaign. Now, that's a, a trademark of Kerry Vincent coach teams everywhere he's been. Hopkinson once again baseline sealed off there. Sherlock Chance gets a piece of it. Hopkinson tries to run it down and can. 16-12 remaining. It's a 21-point lead here in the second half. Durham's defense has continued the tough defense, the double teaming, the traps, and so on. That's done a really good job. Jason Bridge for three. His second three. He lights it up there. That cuts the lead to 18 now. And Hopkinson once again. Johnson against two guys, forces that one. Might have been some contact. Johnson certainly lets the ref know. Here's Lester Jones. Sherlock Chance, the only guy back. Now that basket's going to go. Jones is going to go to the line. He now has 12 in the game. He has a chance to add another. And the dramatic back at counts call by Riffrey Pierce. <laughs> There's no, no doubt, doubt about, about that. the bucket went. It went in. And now Jones go to the line for a chance to make it a three-point play. Jones far and away leads the team in free throw attempts. He's been in the line 50 times. But this is his first time can't go on the line in this game. That's a good sign that the defense has been very strong and he hasn't had his way as he usually does. Get a good look at Lester Jones there. In and out. No chance good. clears the boards, his favorite spot, banging onto the boards. Jordan pass to Jones. Johnson sees Tate wide open. Nice look from Johnson. And Tate throws it in for two. He's got eight on the game. Look at a smile on Tate's face. He knows a good pass from, from Pat Johnson. He appreciates that type of play. Tate averaging seven points a game now over his season average. Tough D there. Hopkins and Jordan. Somehow Kerr gets away. Finds Sherlock Chance. And a traveling call underneath. The, the oh, somehow chance, guy back here traveling call something I didn't see. Stafford Kerr has great quickness. And that's how he got out of that double team, and that's one way to do it. Certainly like that young player, outstanding player, his first year with the Huskies. Quick player. Listen, Jones is having a break now. He's uh, one of the players that George Brown certainly is going to need as we as we go down the stretch here. But Lester Jones having a break. Patrick Johnson, big time three-point range, NBA three-point range, doesn't go. Tate gets a piece out, he gets it back to Johnson. And he kisses it off the glass. This time, Johnson hits, and Patrick now has 10 points of the game. Press breaker, tough to do, they haven't done it well. Chance is gonna pick that one off. That was quite the athletic play by Sherlock. Chance went high, and I think he tried to save it and keep it in bounds. Well, a close play there, a close game. Chance hadn't really come down in the line yet. The whistle had already blown. But uh, unless the ball hit it, we're unusual. I think he called him on, on the foot of the line. But here we go. Foot of the line for two. Jordan has it now. He'll slow it down. See Augusto de Kessie taking a break. He goes out with 22 points in the game. And John Tate replaces him. Hopkinson draws a foul there. And it'll be on the pass. Hopkinson draws another foul. So quick in this first dribble. Kenrick Hopkinson's show continues, Ken, when you see plays like that. 
what I'd what be most impressed, I think, about Hawkinson so far in this game, I don't think he's had any turnovers. He's handled that ball very expertly, very smartly. He knows when to pass it, and he knows when to give it up, and he knows, as we've seen, when he can take it straight to the hole himself. And this time, getting into the offensive swing of things, he takes it up strong. Johnny Tate follows it. Kendrick makes it happen. Tate follows it. Tate has 10. Tate's quite the presence off the bench. Uh, can you imagine having Augusto sit down and bring in big John Tate, about six foot eight, 10 points off the bench. What a tandem. John Tate, hometown Barry, attended all his high school at Guelph. And he's in general studies this year, just his first year with the Lords after transferring from the University College of Cape Britain. Hopkinson, nice try there. You saw Hopkinson there on the All-Star game with an outstanding feed all the way down court. That almost duplicated that. The cameraman, as always, taking the charge of the play. <laughs> it's a tough job out there. Tate with a big mismatch there against Joe Field. Hopkinson settles down with a 30, 20 seconds on the shot clock. A little too much there. Patrick trying to do a little too much on that one. Loses the ball. 13-33 remaining. It's a 22-point Durham lead. Oh, going up for the jam there. Certainly no doubt about that. He wasn't going to make it that far. And a foul of the play goes against Sherlock Chance. That's his third foul of the game. And the team's third this half. Durham still utilizing the, the traffic double teaming defense. And it's been very effective for the most part. We see Joe Field going to the line. You know, this will be his 10th free throw attempt on the season. And he gets the lucky bounce. Rock and roll with falls there for the first one. I think Joe Field knows he had a bit of a lucky bounce there. He enjoyed that. And this time, no lucky bounce. Tate clears it off the shelf, and back comes Hopkins. A nice pass. Just a little bit behind Hopkinson has a laugh about it. Had Jordan just a little bit behind him. I said that was key back, just a little bit behind him, but I just want to go back to John Tate. Just textbook box out right there to grab the rebound off the defensive glass. Hopkins is so quick trying to reach in there. Stafford Curry doesn't get to go. Tate gets a piece of it. Out of bounds. Hustle down nicely there. Excellent hustle. Unfortunately for Birch, it goes to a white jersey. Rick Jordan all the way and gets his own rebound. Back up again, John Tate. Jordan's hammer, but Tate falls through. He's got 12 on the game. Well, how many times can we see John Tate go to the offensive glass and have a tip in? 23 point lead now, 69 46. Durham threatening to pull this wide open. Joe Field manages to get the play there on the, the broken defensive attempt. 21 point lead. Hopkinson on the ball once again. Chance posting up. Well, one too many dribbles, loses it there. Back up the Huskies, Johnson all the way back. And Jason Birch lays it in. He's got eight on the game, and a excellent game building up now for Jason Birch. Two threes, he has eight points, and has really logged a lot of time here for the Huskies, number 22. Well, that's a nice job by Birch in terms of body control to make sure the ball goes right in. Rick Jordan for the three. And Ricky Jordan lays it in for three. And Ricky's on the score sheet. We're talking about one of the guys that hasn't hit. Only two players have not, and that is David Pickering and Sherlock Chance. Ten of the 12 have hit the score sheet, and I'm sure we'll see more of that later. There's Patrick Johnson now, waiting for some help. Off the boards, Tate, big rebound. Johnson chases it down. He'll take it right back to the hoop. Big league play, gets his own rebound right back up again and in. And Patrick Johnson draws the foul. What also by Pat Johnson to keep going after the ball, literally can from one side of the court to the other and back. And prior to that, John Tate knocked the ball away, handled the ball expertly to give to give Pat Johnson that great opportunity. We got a timeout here on this Rogers Community 10 broadcast. Take a look at Patrick Johnson living off the court. He now has 12 on the game. He's going to go to the line for one more. We're going to take a look around the OCAA scores from the past week, along with what the Lords have ahead of them, the Lords the rest of the way, and the remaining games they have in this 1994-95 season before the playoffs. They're going to the bench now, quiet and relaxed on the Durham bench, taking their time around the OCAA in the East Division. Durham, a big victory, 87-63. Last Tuesday, right here at the Athletic Center, the big game Friday night, Algonquin 79, Durham 76, right down to the wire. Durham led 76. 675. Algonquin going to the line with foul shots and fouls called late in the game. Gave Algonquin a shot to come back and uh, really the turning point in the game. Augusto being called, which could have been a big bucket for the Lords, being called for an offensive foul when he scored a bucket. 
And it could have went either way, and it didn't go in the favor of the Warriors. It was Augusto's fifth foul. Big win for Algonquin. What it means now, Matt, Durham's going to settle for second now in the East. And don't count out Centennial, who are on a big roll themselves, pushing along in the East Division at five wins and four losses. As we know in an earlier matchup, Durham played Centennial at their campus in Scarborough and only came out with a three-point victory, I think it was. So Centennial certainly is a team to look out for as the rest of the season unfolds. No question there. And here come the Huskies. Johnson misses the mark. It's a 24-point lead. Joe Field, Chance gets a piece of it, tips it back to Birch, who's got the hot hand. Not that time, he misses wide. 15 in the shot clock, loose ball, Jordan picks it up. Can't leave the ball laying around in the key too long with the Lord swarming. Well, as Joe Field was just maybe not the, the fellow behind the ball down like that, he was just determined to go straight to the basket, and that's not the thing to do for a team that's down this much. Rick Jordan for three, Johnny Tate. Johnny's going to signal his hand on that one. He knows he picked up the foul. Referee Peter Stychuk coming to the bench here to signal the foul against John Tate. That's Tate's first, Dean's fourth this half. 11-12 remaining in this second half. Nothing wrong with that foul. Again, he's going straight to the boards. He's, he's not doing anything dirty. He's just trying to get some more points for his team. Adam Estabrooks, number 11, is checked back in. And you know, Kenny, Estabrooks, Adam Estabrooks had a big first half, seven points, including a three-pointer. Great balance in the first half we saw for the Durham Lords. Stolen Hopkinson with another steal. Takes it in. Chase from behind by Birch and Kenrick Hopkinson right now with eight points in the second half now has ten. And showing a little bit of offensive prowess that he doesn't normally put forth here in the regular season, but having a little fun now. Hitting. Certainly so quick in stealing the ball. Uh, wouldn't want to be an opposing guard. His offensive uh, plays are usually uh, limited to setting up other people, as we mentioned, only averages 3.8 points a game or so. But now he's making steals, which leads straight to buckets for himself. I'm sure he's happy about that. Yeah, look see there, had Joe Field all open underneath. Officials timeout on the floor, I think it says. Possibly. Yeah, timeout here, we're not sure why. Maybe he took a, a finger in the face or appears to have been poked in the eye, and that's Stafford Kerr, number 32, taking a break. We see Coach Willie Dellis here, head coach, an outstanding basketball player in his own right at the university level, and also with a traveling team. And a fast break there. We didn't get the chance to see that. We see the Lords versus the Huskies. Durham eight wins in a row against the Huskies. Looking tonight to make it nine. They're eight and zero in the last eight meetings dating back to 1990 against the George Brown Huskies. We're back in action. We see Durham still pressing, still double teaming, and George Brown's having a lot of trouble with his defense. Oh, sure, a chance playing above the rim. He went high for that one and blocked it, but it was goaltending. Let me see Sherlock there. Certainly likes to play above the rims, and he showed it there. Oh, that looked good by Sherlock, but no doubt the, box, the ball was coming down in his trajectory. Therefore, the basket counts. Goaltending called. Good call by the officials. Great for Perret and Augusto de Kessny getting ready to check back in for Coach Kerry Vincent in the squad. Yeah, a few nice guys to come off the bench. Explosive scorers, both of them. Sherlock chance. Big, quick first step right to the hole. Can't get it to go. Estabrooks had a shot at it, some contact, and it'll go over to George Brown. Sherlock's going to check out here. Oh, Greg Sherlock making a beeline to the bench, makes a quick left-hand turn. He's going to stay in. John Tate, Rick Jordan check out. And as we mentioned, Ray for Perret and Augusto de Kesti back into the game. So now we got Perret and Hopkinson. Look for some fireworks here. And sure on chance, maybe uh, they're still looking to get him on the scoreboard. As we been talking about one of the two players who hasn't scored yet. Stole there, Hopkinson again, Perry this time. Nice dish there, Hopkinson takes it right to the hole for two. He's got 12, two points shy of a season high 14. And Perry and Hopkinson are going to join Estabrooks at the top of this half court zone trap. And it works so well. Bikesti playing the big guy in the middle, defending the pass. So tough to beat as they see him just now bringing the ball up. I want to think like this is even though Lester Jones is not in the game, even if he was, this, would, this type of defense would take him right out of it. Lester Jones with 12 points in the game, a long way off his season total average of 27.4. And credit the defensive success of Durham. That's been the name of the game all season long. And Durham showing it again here. They're the number one defensive team in the province. Checking the game for the first time, number 20, Jeremy Curry for George Brown. As Birch has a has a breather after his hot hand, hot shooting here in the second half. Pretty close to a five-second violation here. They got to get the ball in. And they do. Joe Field, left side for the jumper, 
not there. That was number 24, Clint Marshall. Adam with a foul, no question about the foul. He'll pick up his first, team's fifth this half. Estabricks, a third-year forward, a veteran forward for the Durham Lords from Bowmanville. Adam attended Bowmanville High School and is in his graduating year of law and security administration and hopes of becoming a Durham Regional Police Officer in the future. Smoothly made by Ramon Marchetti going to this line. We're talking about free throws right now while the young man Marchetti's at the line for George Brown. Durham, not only leading the league in defense, but the name of the game, Matt, if you can win it at the free throw line, Durham 72.8% at the line. Sheridan, you can see a far cry at 64 down the list. Seneca at 52, we saw how they could shoot two weeks ago. They shot 28% from the line. All the records indicate the top teams are the top foul shooters of Durham, Sheridan, Algonquin. Humber not far behind. Humber at 60%. That could spell uh, spell a different story in a tight game. Humber only shooting 60% right now. We're back to action. Here's Perret. Long pass down. Couldn't quite get it to chance. It's picked off by Stafford Kerr. The Huskies looking to get back in it here as they're approaching. And Adam Estabrooks with a steal. Put that one down on the steal column. Draws the foul and the bucket. Kerr's going to pick up the foul. And Estabrooks gets the bucket to go. He's got nine. He's going to get a chance here to add one more to hit double digits on the game. Stafford Kerr, who's such a, an excellent ball handler for George Brown, is really finding trouble with his press. It shows the quality of the press that, uh, that the Lords are parting to George Brown. Adam Estabrooks, they're looking to make it a three-point play. Estabrooks had a big first half, seven points, making three-pointers, and a one for three-pointer, making some, uh, some deuces, and now with a steal and chance for a three-point player, he's going to have one of his biggest scoring outputs of the season. Good shot, Adam, there. We take a look at Adam at the line. Estabrooks running back, completing the three-point play. He now has 13 points on the game, and uh, rather 10 points on the game, rather. When I mean, you're talking free throws, Ken, Adam has yet to miss a free throw this season. Baseline there, offensive foul. We talk offense. Estabrook's the guy taking the charge on that one. Clint Marshall, I think, is going to be called for his first foul. Clint Marshall drawing a foul there. And we talk about defense. We talk about Estabrook's quality guy at the bench. Probably the number number one six man in the league right now off the bench. Good for 10 to 12 points, night in, night out. Smart with the ball, rarely turns it over. It can also hit the odd three for you. And speaking of threes, Ray for Perret, no stranger to that, lights it up for three. And don't, Ken, don't remember, also came, don't forget, also came off the bench, Ray for Perry, just talked about him with eight points. John Tate came off the bench, and he's got 12 points. It's quite a job by Durham's bench. Yeah, Bill Aran trapping nicely there with Esther Brooks. Tough to handle. They do get the ball in Kerr now, double team again. Estabrooks, Duquesne, nice front there, Duquesne, big block shot by Duquesne. Tries to get a piece of it again, it does go. Marchetti with the bucket. Correction, rather, Stafford Kerr with the bucket on that one. Alward here now with the ball, drives the lane, pulls up for the J. A little bit short. <laughs> And they got a piece of it there, blocked, and uh, for Brian Allward, he's certainly glad that someone called it a block rather than it going in the books as an air ball. Here's Esther Brooks on the end line. Duquesne, liking it up with the point guard position. He's running the O here, had a little smile on his face. Not what Coach Vincent exactly wanted, but he'll give it up to Perret. No, probably the, the biggest point guard in OCAA history. It has to be. Duquesne, no stranger to shoot the three either. Coach Vincent often heard on the bench along with Coach Wallace. No threes, Augusto. No threes. And Augusto quietly smiling. Okay. But he likes to shoot the three the odd time. Augusto's here studying English, improving his English skills. That's uh, Laurent, one of the, turn around. <laughs> one of the oh, knows. No question. No question. He can do it all. And what an exciting player Augusto's been. And what a treat it has been to see him play all season long and follow his athletic success. Not only that, his academic success, approaching uh, approaching the grades satisfactory for English right now. He's really doing a great job in his class, ahead of his class. And we've talked to his teachers early on in, uh, in the week, ahead of his class, really doing well, enjoying it, and uh, making great strides, speaking English. And you notice it day in, day out, how much he can cover. Coach Vincent's been the toughest one here, learning the communication gap, and has developed his own system until Augusto learns the language a little better. But he is progressing and uh, somewhat comical at times. 
But he certainly knows the basketball language, that's for sure. Pastor Brooks, we mentioned again, and hits for three. What a second half he's had. 13 in the second half, 15 out of the game. Perry tips it, they go to the floor. Excellent hustle by Esther Brooks and Perre. Look at that, look at that shot we have of, of Perry and Esther Brooks, both of them on the floor going for the ball. Even with a 34 point lead, as you see the 89 55, the Durham Lords are still going all out. So their output this game will certainly lend to the fact. Nice pass there. Pass a big block from behind. Esther Brooks with the home run ball. That doesn't matter. What a block shot there by Adam Esther Brooks. And that was a big time play. Not only was it a big athletic play, but a smart play afterwards. He didn't just toss the ball back near the basket. He threw it away so that even if the other team got it, it was still way down there. What a play by Esther Brooks. Esther Brooks at the top. They try to trap Kerr so quick. Esther Brooks right to the floor again. He's got the ball. Trying to call timeout. You can see Adam trying to call timeout with the ball and trying to steal a call. I think Esther Brooks had the oh, ball we got a as jump well ball. as the foot. <laughs> We've got a bit <laughs> of a collision here as we take a look at this play. Augusto taking the brunt of that one. They may have locked heads. And a couple of hard heads there, no question. And That's Augusto my... with his hand on the top of his head. We see That's Raymond Marchetti. Marchetti, number 42, down on the floor right now, seeing attendance. We're going to take a break here in this college action. There's Coach Dellis. You're watching OCAA men's basketball action on Rogers Community 10. March Madness is coming soon. Durham College playing host to the championships. Durham College will most likely be there. We're going to take time out now for a short break on this Rogers Community 10 broadcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about your community channel, Rogers Community 10, please call the Rogers Response Line at 436-3500. That's 436-3500. Your comments and suggestions regarding our programming are greatly appreciated. If you have any questions, don't forget to leave your name and phone number. That's the Rogers Response Line, 436-3500. They're back to action here. Marchetti's okay. Augusto rubbing his head. He appears to be okay with his hard noggin. And uh, we're back to action here. S. Brooks still going after the ball. Sorry, all word number 12. I'm I'm still excited about that last block we saw by Adam Estabrooks, Ken. What a play! Swing it again. 14 in the shot clock now. George Brown forcing it there, right into Augusto land. That's something you want to do. Stafford Kerr so quick with the rebound. He hits it. He's got 13. 5:50 remaining. Second half. The last fourth shot, as you mentioned, Ken, was number 44. Kevin King yet to score today. Maybe he's anxious to get on the scoreboard. There's Duquesne, one-on-one -on -one with Joe Field right now. Doesn't mind handling the ball. Yeah, swing the ball quickly. Augusto from three. Hey, he hits it, but his foot's just on the line. He laughs as he comes back down, asking for three. Just on the line, he hit for two. Tip Estabrooks. Good hustle by Estabrooks, and he draws the foul. And Estabrooks right now, who can we select player of the game-wise? Estabrooks draws an outstanding play there and also draws a foul. Foul call, call number 20, Jeremy Curry, but you talked about player of the game. And, I mean, Adam Estabrooks, even though he's maybe played half the minutes than some of the other guys out there, has certainly made more spectacular plays than any other players out there. There has been many, no more hustle on that one as Estabrooks grabs it, draws a foul. He'll go to the line here to shoot one and one. Right now, it's Allward, Pere, Billy Laron, Estabrooks at the line, and Augusto Duquesne for the Lords. 5.22 remaining second half. Talk before about Estabrooks' free throw shooting outstanding on the air. It doesn't get there very often. But he's perfect. Five Estabrooks five. hits Make the first one. Six. Make it six for six. Estabrooks hits there. We're going to take a look at the Lords' schedule the rest of the way here while Adam takes a break. Let's stay. Let's stay with Estabrooks here as he goes it. Oh, misses first one. Misses Stafford Kerr there. goes high. We're, we're going to hang on for a second here as Stafford Kerr comes back to action here before we see this Lord schedule the rest of the way. Kerr takes it right home. He throws it in for two. He just flew right to the basket there. Eight points in the second half. 17 for the game for Stafford Kerr. That's well above his average of 12 and a half. Perry right to the hole. Nice dish back to build a run. Big block there. Joe Fields says no way. He blocks it. Substitution here into the game. David Pickering. Back into the game, number 33. 
We mentioned his name, Ken, a couple of times. Kirk being one of the two players for Durham yet to score today. I think they've been trying to feed Dave Pickering, trying to get him on the board. And Adam Brooks checks out 15 points. And what a second half for him. Correction, 16 points, rather, with the last foul shot. There's Augusto one on one. Turn around jump for Augusto. Hits the score sheet again. He's got 24. Augusto's had a quiet second half here. Again, just six points to go to with his 20. He had to lead the explosion in the first half. Pressure around 26, we might add for Augusto. Husky's an answer right back. 424 remaining. Ray for Perry now with the ball. It's Pickering and DeKesney posting up. Brian Alward, the other guard position, along with Bill Laron. There's Pickering jump shot just off the mark. Stafford Kerr, an electrifying player for George Brown. He gets it to go. Good second half for him. He's now got 17 points on the game. We're seeing the Stafford Kerr show here. With the light. He's just blown by everyone for the last couple of plays. He can really leap. We've seen him sky high for rebounds and blow past people with his speed. Can I'm surprised we haven't seen Lester Jones come back in this game. I'm not sure what's happening there. Maybe there's an injury or, or some other situation. We're not sure about Yeah, Lester, not one of his better games. Uh, certainly not happy with his performance, averaging 27 a game. Right now on the bench with 12. He hasn't come back into the game. 349 remaining. We got a bonus situation here and now back into the game. Checking back into the game. Rick Jordan. We take a look at the Lords the rest of the way next Tuesday. February 14th at Seneca. That's a big game at the Seneca Sports Center on Newham campus. Highway 404 and Warden Avenue. Uh, we take a look at uh, Seneca. Must win for the Lords if they want to get some momentum going in. February 18th, big trip up to Sudbury on the road. And again, February 22nd, we mentioned all three games after this one tonight uh, on the road. Oh, sorry, that, that could be tough for, for the Lords. We know they're a good road team, but these, uh, these teams they're facing. Cambrian, Cambrian struggling a bit. We saw some of the highlights of the action earlier this week. Cambrian had a nail biter and also another game. So they're down to three and seven. But uh, anything could happen in the crazy world of basketball. And OCAA. Right, you learn, anything could happen. We take a look at the standings early on in the season. Cambrian has now fallen to three and seven. They were three and uh, three at one time. Lost their last four in a row. We got a timeout on the floor here. 349 remaining. And the score, the Durham Lords, 96. The Centennial Colts, rather. It's been a long game. George Brown, You're College looking Huskies. To You're looking I'm looking forward to, forward to Centennial too much. The Huskies, 65. We've got a break here. We take a look at the timeout here. Coach Willie Dellis a dejected George Brown College bench. They've just had too much thrown at him from, from uh, the Durham Lords. That's that's Ramon Marchetti right there. Ken took that, that hard blow against, uh, against Augusto. That about sums it up right here. A little bit of ice on the forehead there. I'm sure a lot of the players of the George Brown team would like to do that. But when you've had uh, the defense... See, hides a little bit from the camera. A little camera shy. But, uh, we take a look now. Too much for George Brown. A lot of teams have found it tough to handle Durham. And Durham's on track right now for March Madness. OCA Final Four, March 3rd and 4th right here. The top four teams, each division, make the playoffs. The top two in each division host a sudden death quarterfinal game. The winners of those four quarterfinal games advance to the final four. What is shaping up right now? Durham looks like they'll get a lock after today's win on the two spot in the east. The three spot right now occupied by St. Clair will likely be who Durham will be hosting on February 28th. Sudden death playoff game. Tickets will be a hot one for that one. They'll go on sale the week before the game. Good, Laurent playing some top D there. I'm, I'm very impressed, Ken, with the fact that the Durham Lords have not let that one bit come to defense. Well, that one goes for three there. Kevin King gets his first bucket of the game, number 44. 326 remaining. Right back down, and David Pickering hits the score sheet. And we're still waiting for Sherlock Chance to round out all 12. Matt, you mentioned before, 11 of the 12 Durham Lords have hit the score sheet. Ironically, just a, a perfect example of the depth of this team. Sherlin Chance is one of the starters on, on the squad, and also to start the second half, and he's yet to score. Let's take a look at some of the fans here. Fan support been great all season long. Jam-packed house Friday night. Good crowd on hand once again tonight, but what a jam place it was Friday night for Algonquin. Well, everyone knows that that's the big matchup. The two best teams in the East, and they certainly played that way. Algonquin just coming out on top. And right back again, Kevin King, back-to-back -back threes. 98-71, Durham poised now to hit the century mark. 
First time they've done it against George Brown in the last eight meetings. They are 8-0 and oh against the Huskies their last eight times in conference play dating back to 1990. That one tries for it up and over Rafer off the backboard, across the backboard, and out of play. Kent Durr made it the 100-point barrier one time earlier this year against Centennial. A game, in fact, we saw here on Rogers, 104-70, a blowout by Durham. Lowers Who could forget that second goals. half, too, as well? 58-12, to 12, Durham outscored Centennial in that second half. It was about a three-, four-point game or so going to halftime. Off the mark there. Villaron chases it down. Has his eye on the basket. Look to pass. Unfortunately, all he had to do left was shoot with nobody open. And they'll keep the ball with a new 30. And a good look at Kevin Keith there who made the last two three corners for the Huskies. Rafer Perry is going to have a seat now to the, the, the big applause from the fans. They loved his performance today. Rafer Perry checks out. A big applause from the audience. Rafer certainly a fan favorite. Checks out of the game with eight points and another big three-point attempt that went. Here's Oak back to Rick Jordan. They move it around. Allward looking to hit. He doesn't there, but Oak chases it down. Allward can't buy a bucket. Oak can. Big rebound by the big guy, number 30, Gary Oak. He's going to go to the line to shoot two. Take a look at Oak averaging 0.8 points per game. It shows you the kind of playing time he gets, no less, but no guy tries harder than Gary Oak. David Pickering averaging one point a game. Both these guys seeing adequate playing time tonight and crucial minutes. Have you always been there to give Coach Vincent quality minutes when called upon? And th this ironic how you mentioned those two two fellows. We uh, heard about them heard about them early today for the uh, the recipient. They're both recipients of the Rob Burnett Memorial Scholarship. Gary Oak not too happy with that one. <laughs> well, they uh, probably moved the rim back. Gary's going to say they moved the rim on him. But he hits the second one, no problem. Calm, cool, and collects it and right. drains it through. And he's now equaled. He's, in fact, he's almost tripled his season output. And Gary Oak, what can we say about a uh, great young kid, Gary Oak? Doesn't matter if you miss him, how you miss him. If you miss him, they're all the same. If you make them, they're all the same. Rick Jordan, nice pass inside. Bill LaRon weaves his way in. Billy LaRon with four points in the game. But the bench really output today has been outstanding. 101, 71, Durham in the century mark. 140 remaining. It's for fans interest, the Durham College record for most points scored in the game is 136 scored against Loyalist College in the 1982 season. Yeah, blocking foul. Rick Jordan's going to take the foul there. That will be, if I'm correct, is fifth. Oh, a little slip of the pen here. We got him down for four. We thought it was his fifth. Rick gets a reprieve, and he gets a reprieve, and he gets to stay in the game, and he smiles about that. 123 remaining. Stafford Kerr has had an outstanding game here for George Brown. Stafford Kerr, 21 points on the game, going for more. It's the free throw, 22. 12.6 is his average, so we know he's had a super game. He's probably the, definitely the player of the game so far, or uh, I'm sure for the whole game. Player of the game for George Brown, Stafford Kerr right there. At that time, Gary Oak clears down the boards. Rick Jordan, 120 remaining, 120 remaining. And here come the white jerseys of the Durham Lords and once again. Hey, Rick Jordan for two. Nice baseline move. He's got five. One minute to go. And Stafford Crew, a nice baseline move. Rick Jordan hangs on. Back come the Lords. It's run and gun time with a minute to go. Got a foul there. Stafford there. Stafford Kerr quickly grabbing him. Stafford Rick Jordan's going to go to the line here. Two shots in the bonus foul. He'll have two. 
103-72, Durham has put this game away, and they put it away early, I think, with a defensive pressure, special pressure, especially the, the, trap, the, the traps, the half-court traps, and George Brown just never able to figure out how to get past them. See, this time why Rick's at the line here, no question about it. Next, Rogers television action. We switch over to volleyball, February 16th, doubleheader action, 5.30 and 7.30. The Durham Lords play host to Loyalist College and the ladies, and also Loyalist College and the men's. The Loyalist men's game, the Loyalist ladies game, a non-conference game. The Loyalist men's game, a battle for first place. The Loyalist Lancers 11-1. The Durham Lords will be 10-3 by that time. Durham looking for a big crowd on hand. Expect the place to be jam-packed. Tickets are on sale now. It's the Lancers and the Lords. Doubleheader action. The ladies also play. Coach Stan Marchand and his squad as well, having his troops wind into the OCAAs in fine form. Both teams are looking in poise to move into the national rankings. And what an outstanding volleyball season. Rogers will be there February 16th. Doubleheader action. See it live and then see it on Rogers. Kerr with the rebound, 16 seconds to go now, can't get it to go. Gary Oak tries long down the court, Bill Laron chases it down. He can't get it, eight seconds. Five, Kerr traveled, 4.9 seconds remain. They're having fun on the court now, 105-72. Durham with one last chance here, and they're gonna try to score. There's Pickering over the hands of Brian Allward out of bounds. Got to work on that play. Well, not critical, obviously, at this point with a 33-point lead, but I heard a, a call from the George Brown coach. Good job. Still, Willie, Willie Dell still coaching this team here, even though they're down by 30 and the game's over. We're going to wind it down. Here's Kerr. Gary O committing uh, not what Coach Vincent would say, a great foul. They're having fun, but in the essence of 4.9 seconds to go, Gary, I guess, taking the abuse from the bench. He doesn't have a lot of block shots, so he's trying to pad his statistics, I think. Players don't do that, Ken. You know that. Coach Willie Dellis of the George Brown Huskies, calm, collective, knows what his team uh, was up against tonight. And uh, certainly Stafford Curtin, who he was up against, had a big game. <laughs> 22 points for Mr. Stafford Curry. He's uh, kind of an all-star performance, even though we didn't see him in the game. Still, still 2.7 seconds left here. Interesting that George Brown is pressing at this point of the game. They weren't pressing too much earlier in the game. They didn't see too much. I don't know before. why. Here's Jordan, 2.5 seconds. Here's Allward. They didn't get a shot away in time. They worked it down the court. The final score, the Durham Lords 105. The George Brown Huskies 73. Durham completes the sweep for this college doubleheader from the Durham College Athletic Complex. My name is Ken Babcock. Matt, you've enjoyed bringing today's color. Give us a synopsis and a final rundown of today's men's game. Well, there's two things I want to point out. One, uh, we just talked about a minute ago, the Durham press that George Brown cannot handle, and that was probably the key. The second thing, the key, if we were to give out a player of the game, I'd say we go to the Durham bench. There's so many guys came off that bench. They total, I added up here, about 43 points coming off the bench from guys like John Tate had a big job. Adam Estabrooks had a huge game. Uh, Rafer Perry came off the bench. These guys are quality players who come off the bench and did an outstanding job. It's just an outstanding game by Durham in all aspects. 11 of the 12 guys hit the sheet, as you mentioned, for the Lords. Another win. There's 7-2 and two in conference play now. Cruising along, almost assured of finishing in the second spot. I think so, okay. The OCAA uh, regular season standing. Durham will then host a third-place team from the West, which is shaping up to be St. Clair. That game is sudden death playoff game. When that happens, February 28th, a Tuesday night, 7.30 sudden death action right here at the Durham College Athletic Center. The matchup, Augusto, Lester Jones. Augusto wins that one going away. 26 points for Augusto in great defense. Lester, 12 points. I didn't see a lot of time yeah. at the end. But Augusto, a lot more help, half. though. Augusto, a lot of help from everyone on this team. Prime time player. We're just about ready to wrap up here for the entire Rogers Community 10 crew. Another great day of basketball at Durham College. My name is Ken Babcock for Matt Ackler. We'll see you next time on Rogers Community 10.